Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! 1 0 for the Cleveland Cavaliers! Wow, that was, that was hey. Let's represent this real quick. Hey, hey, hey listen. The <laughs> fact this is this. You know what? This is trash. This you is guys are pocket. hating on me today. Oh, oh yeah. Jay, look, Jay has multiple privileges, <laughs> and that means he get the shirt. They gave him that shirt. He didn't go to the game. They just put it in the mail for him. Here you go, dog. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> Hey, where that? Hey, where that? When you get in, hey, big fella. Bro, me and Mike was in the building. <laughs> Y'all didn't see what we, we was. No, we seen him. Y'all, you, yeah, you, we got a good look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Was, don't so touch that. They, you, That's you, all you. of the fans got one. All the fans. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasize on the fans got one. <laughs> I'm like, man, listen, man. If you had a ticket, you got a shirt. You got a gift box. Yeah, it's a beautiful gift box. Yeah, you had a media Some pass. Cleveland Company caramel corn was in there. That was real good. Dude, Real dude, good, bro. You light, hear this, Mike? <laughs> light, crunchy, but not too crunchy. I think he's just being facetious. No, hey, I'm being man, dead look, serious. Hey, listen. The Cleveland Company caramel corn that was in there was on point. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? He got the honey. We had none of that. You know, Me and Mike got no shirts, no co- no popcorn. You know what the best the item in the top. box was? The one that everybody upstairs wanted? The Stanley Cup. Those things, people are like going nuts for those cups. It was a Stanley Cup. In the, man, that Stanley Cup was like 50, 60 bucks. I know. But everybody upstairs wanted it. Everybody. Well, well too bad you didn't get it. Did you one. give it to your wife? I had to. My <laughs> wife's been looking for one for like a month. These, these, this, these gift bags. Uh, listen, hey, man, when I retire, I might get a gift bag. Like, they might give me one of these gifts. I might get a gift bag when I'm done. So, Kaz, if you're watching, I am backpedaling hard today because my <laughs> colleagues on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show did not receive the gift bags. So, and they, they do this like five times a year. They send stuff, shirts. Remember the chains? Yeah. They sent that last year. They sent they regularly. Yeah. That's yeah. There it is. Adam the Bull to mess it up for us. <laughs> we, he Why would he do? He done, I don't know. Yeah. He, he listen. He, they, they they get us on. They get him on his futures. We, what is he gonna say <laughs> next week? It ain't this week. Come on, man. They you gonna get him on his futures? <laughs> yeah, that's they a treat Bull deal. like they used to do Will Smith. <laughs> Will did it. <laughs> I'm sorry, boy. We playing around. We just playing with uh, you. Wow, what a win. What a win. We're okay. going to go in-depth on that. We're also going to look at tonight's game two. Um, I, there's so much to dissect from game one. It was, it was nutty. But the bottom line is the Cavs did what they had to do. They didn't just win. It was an emphatic win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, were some, there were some valleys, yeah. and we'll talk about all that. Uh, also, the Guardians just keep doing it, man. Guardians and folk. They've won four in a row. They sweep the A's. Yeah. And I know, look, everybody's saying it's the A's. Um, A's have a better they, record than the Twins. I know they do. And they get paid, too. And they uh, come in here hot. They had finally put together a little stretch of baseball where they were looking like a real Major League Baseball team. And the Gardos just shut them down with great starting pitching, unbelievable bullpen pitching. Their bullpen is just... It's just like bring them in one after another, and you're throwing up goose egg after goose egg. That clutch hitting. And the clutch hitting that has clutch been. clutch hitting. It was crazy. Every time the A's would bring it close, something would happen, something and would the happen. guards would score three or four and put it away. Hey, hey, listen, I'm just impressed by even even the guys when they get two strikes, they find in places to put it in play. So true. Right. They That's just very well said. You know, I I just I, I you watch them, and the more and more they play. That energy level, I think there's a little bit of buzz. People stop me. G. Bush. I'm thinking they're going to say Browns. Guardians. Hey, the Guardians. I'm, I'm thinking about going to two, three games. They're front of mind right yeah. now. They've got the best record in baseball. Yeah. They, w- what's crazy to me is when you look at their roster, there are guys on there that you're like, wait, who's this? But for the most part, at one point or another, and it's only 22 games, mm-hmm. but everybody has contributed. Everybody. Everybody. Austin Hedges isn't hitting a ton. But I think he's got a home run, and he's been great defensively. And he's throwing people out. He's throwing people out, and that's cutting down rallies when yeah, you do is. that. It is. I mean, to your point, man, I don't care if it was the A's, the B's, or the C's. A sweep <laughs> is a sweep. And <laughs> right. you, play, you play who's 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 on your schedule. And, like, I think that me and Mike was talking about it this morning. 
I think we need to stop waiting on the bottom to fall out and probably just accept, okay. We're going to talk about that. Like, this team so, is good. To put it into perspective, which is I always try to do this, 22 games is the equivalent of an inning and an out in a game. That's mm. how deep. The, it, so, in other words, when you're four outs into a baseball game, a nine-inning baseball game, that's how far the Guardians are into the season. You can, you you know what can happen in a baseball game in nine innings. It's a marathon. Yeah. And so is the season. And look, I'd much rather be sixteen and six than six and sixteen. Right. So there's a lot of positive. But are we ready to say this is not fool's gold? That this is sustainable, and that this is who this club is? We're going to talk about that later in the show. And Mikey's gone in on the Cavs game with some concepts. What this team did, what might be coming in game two, things that Orlando did that actually worked, and they did some things that worked. Um, We'll get into that. Also, we're going to talk about the Browns. Uh, There's a new rating out, uh, ranking, that has um, Nick Chubb. They rank the AFC backs. You might be surprised where Nick Chubb comes in. We're going to talk about that. Is that warranted? Is that unfair? We'll get into that, and we'll also talk draft. Yeah, it's a big show. A lot to get to. It is a playoff Monday in Cleveland. That is phenomenal to say. The Guardians are hot. The Cavs are hot. The Browns are almost on the clock. It is a great time to be in Cleveland. It's also a great time to bet with FanDuel. It is playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe and secure. Plus, it's easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And we are continuing to fly through our winning tickets from last week. Cody Nicewanger made a bunch of money betting on a ton of different Kobe White game props from their play-in game win over the Atlanta Hawks. He live bet him to go over 40 points in the game. That hit, he bet him to go over 35 points. That also hit, he bet over 8 points in the second quarter. That hit, he also bet over 8 points in the first quarter. (laughs) That hit, and when he had it all together, he bet about 20 bucks and won about $400 Mm. on a bunch of Kobe White props. So make sure you guys keep sending us in those winning tickets. The Cavs don't have to worry about Kobe White because they're playing the Orlando Magic. The only thing that happened in the first game that has anything to do with Kobe White is the opposite. The Magic couldn't shoot. Defensively, the Cavs were elite. And guys, what was your big takeaway from that 97-83 win over the Orlando Magic on Saturday to take a 1-0 series lead? Uh, For me, the biggest takeaway was, man, the Cavs blew out the Orlando Magic and they didn't play their best basketball. And for me, I think that that screams scary hours for Orlando for the rest of the series. You know, I asked Donovan Mitchell after the game, uh, you know, about what could you do better or what could this team do better in game two? And he said there's a lot of things that they can do better. You know, they can assist more. They can move the ball more. They can be more stout on the defensive end of the court. And so to see the Cavs come out and win in dominating fashion, they never trailed. They led by as many as 20 points. And we know that they didn't play their best brand of basketball. It tells me that I think both teams will play better. But even when, with Orlando playing better, I don't think they're better is good enough to beat the Cavaliers. Even if they're playing their best? Or? Even if they're playing their best. I, wa- I came away from that game like <laughs> with so much confidence about the rest of the series going forward. Like If you look at the first quarter, Jay, the Cavs hit five three-pointers, and they didn't hit another three-pointer until like the fourth quarter, right? That's true. So you, you end up with eight for the game. You turn the ball over 18 times. And so when your shot is not falling and you're turning the ball over, that's typically a recipe for disaster. But when you come out and you be that stout on the defensive end of the court, when you out-rebound Orlando by 14 and you end up beating them by 14, it showed me that the Cavaliers dug into their toolbox and found a different way to win. Interesting. It told me, you know what I found out? That they weren't no sucker deluxes. Like, they came out and was really physical, and they, they, they showed that we will not be pushed around. We will not be, we will not be bullied. We will not be punked. And I, and, and, and the thing that really sit, sit, sits home with me and hit home with me was when you look at Isaac Okoro and Isaac Okoro as Wagner, I told you about Wagner 
This guy, he's a goon. He listen. He he's he's a European <laughs> runway model that wants to be a goon. We will not be bullied by him. And I, Isaac Okoro gave him that shove in the back to let him know. Playoff time. George George Niang. Yeah, I like the minivans. I like his energy. He got that technical foul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? I like those guys being the mouthpiece for Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Mm -hmm. I thought Mobley and Allen played. They're probably one of their best two playoff games that I've seen as far as rebounding, physical, getting to the rim, dunking the ball when you got a small on you, dominate them, turn and dunk. We'll see that later in the uh, later in the show. Mikey showed me that with Evan Mobley when you got a bit when you got a small dude on you, he was dunking everything, rebounding. To me, it wasn't nothing that happened in the score sheet or the threes. It it was the fact that the, the, the if you look at game one against the Knicks. Game one against the Magic, we said all year, we don't care nothing that happens during the regular season, we want to see it in the playoffs. The thing we got was physicality, energy, and effort, and that's the way they're going to have to play the rest of the series and, and, and further when they move on, Jay. Couldn't agree more with the physicality part. Uh, they'll face teams that are more physical than Orlando in the playoffs for sure, mm -hmm. but I don't think – I think what they did was they matched Orlando's intensity, mm -hmm. which is what I wanted to see. I didn't want to see what happened last year where the Knicks came out at the opening tap, they punched the Cavs in the mouth, and the Cavs needed a standing eight count the rest of game one and really the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. uh, after the game, Darius Garland said that we made it a point to bring the physical style of play to them because of what happened to us last year in Orlando. That tells me they learned the very valuable lesson that when the playoffs start, the difference between the regular season and the playoffs is similar to the difference between NFL preseason mm -hmm. and NFL regular season. Mm -hmm. It kicks up a lot, and it's the same thing with the NBA playoffs. So the first thing that really struck me was, mm -hmm. oh, the Cavs aren't about to be pushed around. Mm -hmm. And I love the Nyang technical. Love it. It was, you know, whatever you, okay, you give up a shot. Who cares? Okay, about What that. you say, and they still came out of that, that exchange better off because mm -hmm. they got two shots and the ball. Um, you don't want to do something stupid. You don't want to get a player ejected. You don't want to do that in a late and close situation where you're giving them free points. But in the first half, when you feel they're starting, and they were starting to push the Cavs around at that point. Yes. And you could see Wagner was looking at the crowd yeah, and he yeah, was yep. shaking his head. Yeah, I'm getting under y'all's skin, aren't I? And the Cavs said, no, that's not about to happen to us. So that was my biggest takeaway. A couple of other things. Um, the three-point shooting is inexplicable. <laughs> and it's also not acceptable. You come out... <laughs> Donovan Mitchell hit one with the shot clock expiring off one foot, falling yeah. out of bounds, 30 feet from the hoop. <laughs> Backwards. Nailed it. I'm like, oh, they're going to hit everything they throw. Well, from that point on, they were actually 3 of 25 from the three-point range. Yeah, they missed 18 straight. 18 of straight. Of those three, three they of made at the end were very late in the fourth quarter. And like, it was pretty late. much take them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was take them. So... And Mike, I'll let you get into this when we start looking X's and O's. I was asking myself, did they change their defense so much on our perimeter shooters that we can't? But I don't think that was the case because they were getting open looks. They were. And they just kept missing. So when they started five for five, I said, that's not going to continue. I just didn't think they'd miss their next 18. Yeah. So on the positive, you shoot 12% from three after the first quarter. And you win the game yeah. by 14 points. Jay, so, can I show you something real quick? Yes. Steve, take tag board full. Part of the reason you could win when you miss 18 consecutive threes is this stat. Orlando's five guards, they shot four of 35. They were worse. They I know. were significantly worse. But now, it, Mike, I expect that from Orlando. I'm not that bad. Well, that's historically bad. I know. I don't expect. Well, we were 12% after we made their first five. I don't Somehow expect still better. Honest to God, I thought I was watching, to quote G. Bush, I thought I was watching the BGSU Summer <laughs> BTJB Tournament brought to you by whoever the sponsors were. Right. I, was, I laughed so hard at that because I said, I know that tournament. Uh, shout out because we went. And to that's what I'm looking at right we, now. We went to high school. Shout out, shout out to Coach Dockage. We went to that tournament every year in high school. It was just, it was hard to look at. It was rough. And 
I, I, we expected it to be ugly. We mm-hmm. expected it to be physical. We expected it to be low scoring. Check, check, check. However, I, I think that the Cavs, I, am I concerned moving forward in, the, in this series? Not really. Mm-hmm. But the series will change when it goes south. Yeah, it will. It will change. It we will. know that. And that building, even if they come home 0-2, that building's going to be cranked, uh-huh. and they're going to be ready because it's been a minute for them. Yeah. But I still think that this is a series they should and will win relatively easy. S- five, six games, something in that order. But, and we're going to talk about it, Evan Mobley when we pivot here, and I don't know that we're ready to do that yet. But Evan Mobley, again, was Jekyll and Hyde. It- he was everything we've wanted him to be in the first quarter. I think, and I, after that, he disappeared. So, see, I think uh, well, we'll, we'll look at, offensively. Yeah, no, I know. I he know had exactly ten rebounds, I think, we'll, in the second half. We'll look at some of the coverages um, that they put on him. I think some of the coverages was different. They were switching it a little bit different. Mikey has showed us that. I think. I think also though, um, it's just a, it's just an emphasis. I don't. I don't think they they put an emphasis on saying, "Hey, look." You know, when when the Cavs used to have uh, Kevin Love, they used to say Kevin Love's first quarter. He's getting it every time. We want to feed him. Get him involved. Get involved. If they, I think they they he, they found a mismatch they had, and I wanted to see them get the ball back down to him a okay. little bit more. Now, in the course of the game, and in the first you know first uh, uh, you know game in the playoffs, sometimes the flow of the game gets you a little bit. Sometimes you know you want to, you still want to get Donovan going. You still want to get Darius going. And I can't be. I ain't gonna be too mad, Earl, because. I think that they they did a good job of saying if you look at the big three, you had Allen, mm-hmm. you had uh, you had uh, Mobley, and you did have uh, Donovan Mitchell who put up really good numbers, right? Mm-hmm. So I can't be mad. They did get three out of the four involved. Sometimes it's the flow of the game. Well, you know, JB Bickerstaff said in the uh, <laughs> pregame conference that you know for him it was pivotal for the Cleveland Cavaliers to come out and get off to a fast start, control the pace and make Orlando chase them for the rest of the game. Which they did. And that's exactly what the yeah, Cleveland Cavaliers did, did. And, you know, Mike has talked in the past about getting Evan Mobley involved early just to get the rhythm going for him. You know, to your point about this series is going to change when they go south, Donovan Mitchell alluded to that. He says, you know, game one is cool, but we have to do it over and over and that's over right. again. And he says, you know, especially when we go to Orlando and there's no whiteout, right? Mm-hmm. And right. so I think that the mindset of this team, they're locked in. And they understand, like, okay, yeah, this is one game. We didn't play our best game. We know we need to play better in game two. But not only that, we have to be consistent, right? And, like, you talk about Evan Mobley being Jacqueline High as far as first quarter, as far from a scoring perspective. Right. And then, what, 16 points in the first half, no points in the second half, None. He was 0 for 3 shooting. He wasn't even shooting the basketball. Right. And so, I don't like that, but I do like the fact that he still found a different way to have an impact on the game. I like that because he did defensively. What I want to ask Mike is, so Mike, is this a situation where the Cavs said, we're going to see what you guys want to stop. And it was clear that they did want to stop Mobley offensively. And then they said, okay, pick your poison. You can take Mobley out of the game, but we've got Allen and we've got Mitchell and we've got Garland that can step up, pick up the slack, and you can't stop everyone. Is that what happened? I think early Orlando's game plan was we're going to make Evan Mobley take and make those shots, see if he can, and he obviously made him pay. And then they switched some coverage. And we're going to talk Mobley in more in depth in one sec, but there's two more things I want to mention in game one before we dive into the Mobley discussion because I think okay. there's a lot more to dig into. Donovan Mitchell in game ones of playoffs here, he now has five straight game ones with 30 or more points. Oh, wow. It's the third longest streak in NBA history. For really? his career, Steve, take tag board full. Minimum of 40 games played. This guy who did not play well in the postseason last year has the seventh highest points per game average in NBA history in the postseason. I understand last year's Knicks series was not good enough. And the reason the Cavs were unable to beat the Knicks does not fall solely on his shoulders, but as the leader, Donovan takes a large brunt of the blame for not playing up to par. But I think we do have to give this man a little more credit. And I understand a lot of it was in Utah, not here. Right. For how well and how consistent he's actually played in these big moments. And coming off the injury, we talked how healthy would he be. He looked pretty damn healthy in game one. I thought so, too. And made some really difficult shots against the defense that is physical, athletic, and tried to make things difficult for him. So I just want to spend a second on Donovan because that was as good as he looked in a long time. Yeah. When the guy stagnant, there was a point in the third quarter where, where Orlando, the game was a little nip-tuck. 
Um, they had, I think they really did a good job of slowing it down. They have fought back. Um, and Orlando's a really good defensive team. I think, and I, I, I tweeted this, I said, well, this is, this is the time where Donovan Mitchell has to put the cape on. There's certain little spurts of the game where you're playing a team and you may be favorite in that series and that team may be fighting tough and fighting difficult. And if you watch it all around the NBA, I think I watched every single, uh, f- at least the first round, first game of every single uh, game in the NBA playoffs. In every, in every one of those series, you got a, a, a big time superstar um, that steps up and says, "Up, oh, we let it, we, we down. You know, we're, the game got down to a four point game. Let me get a couple buckets, and put it back right. up to eight. Each each and every series, you saw that. And I thought Donovan Mitchell did a good job of understanding the moment and saying, "Oh no, no, let me get to the rack, let me get to the line, let me finish this." And then the other the other guys kind of helped to push that, it out. To that point, there was a scoring desert from. Mitchell had a slam with four minutes to go in the first quarter. I think it put the Cavs up double figures. Mm-hmm. Yep. And he looked very athletic. First time we've seen him I, dunk since – Yeah. A second get, dunk since the All-Star break. First since he got the knee injury. And, and after that play, I said, okay, that's the explosion. That's what we haven't seen from mm-hmm. Mitchell. He went to the rim with authority. Mm-hmm. And, but what happened was I thought the crowd was at its peak at that point because mm-hmm. it was their – I think it was their biggest lead at that point. Uh-huh. And – that was the four-minute mark of the first quarter. Then they hit a scoring desert of 10 minutes. They scored nine points in the next six, uh, 10 minutes with six minutes to go in the second quarter. They just – and, Mike, I, I wanted to lean on you here. Why? Was that Orlando's adjustments or was that the Cavs were just missing shots? They missed a bunch of good looks. I mean, they you really look at did. a lot of their three. Struess had two or three ones he normally makes, didn't make them. Garland had a couple. I mean, Mitchell came out. Whenever Mitchell comes out of the game, that's his normal break time. Their offense isn't as good without him on the court. And I thought the way Orlando guarded Darius Garland as opposed to Donovan Mitchell in the screens, which will break down, uh, did play a factor. But they just missed shots. And it was a game that had a ton of physicality. We talked in the post game to JB and the players about they practiced for the physicality. Mm. How did that compare to what it actually expected? The rest called nothing. It was a war nope, out there. That was a let him play was, game like I can't war. remember, I, guys. Hey, listen, I'm telling you And this. I like that, by the way. L- I, 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 listen, I've been dying to see that. It makes the game more watchable. Did, but I didn't notice that in the other playoff games. Uh, I, I, I noticed that they was letting them play out the Suns game and the Timberwolves. I thought they let them play in the Clippers versus uh, – who did the Clippers play? <clears throat> Mavericks. Mavericks. I thought they let them play in that game. I, I think they're setting it up in game one. It's about the team that comes out and understands that, like, listen, we, we want to bring it to them. So, hey, if we get a couple fouls early, so what? But I put the onus on the ref to call the foul. And I thought they, they did a good job of understanding that moment. They let them play, though. You know what it reminded me of? It wasn't nearly as physical and, and knock them to the floor, but it reminded me of the late 80s NBA, mid, mid to late 80s NBA, where mm-hmm. they just would let them go stretch after stretch, and you'd be like, wow, no whistle there, no mm-hmm. whistle. Mm-hmm. There'd be two or three times where there was no whistle, and it, first of all, it keeps the game moving along. It doesn't stop at every 30 seconds. And I think the players, once they understand that, oh, that's how we're going to play. Yeah, it takes one time. I think now they know, and they're going to see if that, if that officiating style carries throughout the series. I think that's a huge benefit to the Cavs. I just do. Even though Orlando is probably by nature the more physical team, it will allow the Cavs to retaliate and to jack it up to that same level without fear of foul. Not, not just that, and I know we got to move on. No, we got plenty of time, bro. We All right, so like rush. when, like, and, and Mike can attest to this. When Donovan Mitchell came out, you know, for pregame warm-ups, Steph lost through on whatever song that Donovan likes, right? That man looked over at Steph, gave a bow, and just locked in. And you could just tell from that moment what type of game it was about to be. And I tweeted out, you know, Orlando was stout. Right, defensively, they got a damn good defensive they backcourt, do. you know, as far as their guard play. But I don't care how good your defense is, Donovan Mitchell is the best player on the court. And when he's on his game, your best defense is not good enough. I agree. It's just it's just as simple as that. I think the dude is as healthy as he's gonna get, right? He looks damn good, and I think that he's ready to lead this team, you know, past the first round of the series. Like just his energy, his body language, how he asserted himself, like you you watch the game. I mean, he had the crowd going crazy with every dead ball, every foul that was What was called. the atmosphere like in the building? It was absolutely bananas. Nice. Like, I'm telling you, like, they was riled up. 
the Cavs came out, hit their first two three pointers, and it's like they damn near blew the roof off. Yeah. Within the first two minutes of the game. Right. It was crazy. Good, good. Now, there's one thing I will say um, that I think the Cavs will, will want to button up. It's now, let me get, don't get it twisted. They, Orlando is a very good defensive team. So you're going to have, I think they kicked up the on the ball uh, pressure. Um, you know, especially with Jalen Suggs, I think he was giving, he was in, somebody said he was in Darius Garland's back pockets for a little bit of the game. 18 turnover was rough. I thought, you know, you know, I thought a person who really dealt, he, who, who was really affected by the, the pressure was Max Struess. I, I thought he had a very difficult time bringing the ball. It just seemed like from the get go, he wasn't, he couldn't get into, into form and, and he looked like he didn't have that, like. You know, he was ready to go a little bit, but I will give him credit. He did rebound the basketball well at, from the guard position, and that's one of the things that you're going to have to do when you are, uh, you know, nine rebounds there. When you, that's a big boost to get those tough rebounds, especially from a defensive team. He's one or five from three. So that, have, that, that's what surprised me. Didn't have a good, good, good shooting night. I always think it like this. You're going to have to look at these, these two in tandem. JB's going to have to uh, figure out. Who's having a high hand? Isaac Okoro or Max Strews? Right. I look at those guys as combined two players. Um, you may you may not get a good night from one of them, but if you do, you might want to ride the hot hand. Or if one of them is struggling, quickly bring them in. I'm still waiting for Sam Merrill to still c- catch fire. He only had a couple shots missed. Them. So at the end of the day, they missed a lot of shots, and people say it's a make or miss league, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you got the good looks, you keep firing them up. But uh, I think one thing that I would like to see and I would be really encouraged is if Darius Garland could keep that same energy he had at the last end of the fourth quarter. He had a three go down. Um, he was able to hit a couple baskets in a row. And, and, and in this league, you don't want to let saw stars or shooters get their feel because they could carry that over and start having some good vibes. So hopefully th- those points carry over in game two where you can so. get off to a fast start. For, for me, when on a Darius Garland tip, and everybody knows I've been kind of hard on Darius, I thought Darius played a, a pretty damn good game minus the five turnovers. But like to, the way that he kind of like was the floor general, you know, he played point guard very well. Emphasis on the point guard. I thought he was a solid floor general, the eight assists, the ball movement. You know, putting his teammates in the right position uh, to, to, to get a basket. Then he had like four other five passes that turned into assists. Yeah. And so I thought he asserted himself very well. And, you know, I've been big on all I ever wanted to see was Darius Garland assert himself on a consistent basis. Yeah. And that don't always mean shooting and scoring a basketball, but just how he played, right? Like just the feel for the game, the timely passing, the getting his teammates involved. Seemed like he made the correct basketball play more often than not. And then to, for him to drill that three-pointer like late in the game and him to walk away with that big-ass smile on his face, like I thought that was huge for his confidence. Yeah, he needs it. It sounds like his – because in the post-game com- comments, I also heard JB talk about how everybody was trying to get Darius in the right place before the game. That tells me they all know that he's in, in perhaps not the best place confidence-wise. And so I think those games, like you said, that can carry over game to game. Don't let this man get on a roll now. Yeah. Because if he if he turns back into the best Darius Garland, the best version of him, which we've seen sporadically but not nearly enough this year, if he can get back to his best form, which was really we saw I think a year ago, this team is going to be a tough out. Absolutely. I'm not saying they're going to you know they're not, not I'm not predicting them to go to the NBA Finals, but they're going to be a tough out to, for somebody. To Jay's point, we know the man is capable of dropping fifty. Right. Can. We've, well, seen it. we've seen it. We yeah. know what he's capable of doing and games like that helps build the momentum. Right. And if sure. he can just continue to keep that consistency, I think he'd get it turned around. There were still just a couple of turnovers that I thought were sloppy. And, and yeah. but it wasn't of, just by him. It was a few. No, of no them. they were loose and free with the ball yeah. and they've got to clean that up. Yeah, they do. You can't, th- 18 you can't turn over that many times in a mm-hmm. game, especially when they were. That's what, what the biggest surprise was with all of those missed threes and all of those turnovers. I think you said it. That's usually a recipe for a thumping. But they they were f- phenomenal on the boards and they limited Orlando a lot of times to one and done mm-hmm. and that's that's that really was the difference. Elite right, defensive performance and offensively and Evan Mobley's making threes, it changes everything for the Cavs. We'll talk yeah. about that after a quick word from Monopoly Go. I know I'm a competitive person. I think you guys are too. And if you are a uh, competitive person, you better be playing Monopoly Go. It allows you to get your competitive side out in the open 
with millions, and I mean millions of other players. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of big boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you money. The best part? You can mess with your friends, too. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like in Classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob them the vaults for riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. It's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can also team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in on the game. Join your friends. Download Monopoly Go free on the App Store or on Google Play. Guys, Evan Mobley, 16 points in the first half. It was a playoff <gasps> career high. He made two threes in the first quarter. Completely changed how the Orlando Magic had to guard this Cleveland Cavaliers offensive attack. G, I'll start with you. How impressive is what Evan Mobley did in the first half? And does that make what he didn't do in the second half that much more frustrating? Um, no, you know, I, I think the way you, you got to look at it when you talk about playoff basketball is, is by any means necessary. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to get some, some buckets from a lot of guys. You're going to ask if, in the playoffs to get some, some uh, you know, production from everybody. You're going to need to get it from some days it's going to be Mobley. Some days it's going to be Karis LeVert. Some days Max Struess got to step up, Niang, uh, so on and so forth. I think what he did was he was the catalyst for what they wanted to do. And they, he set it up in a way because we've talked about Evan Mobley hitting threes. When you come out and hit two straight three-pointers and, and, and he's the four or five guy, now that changes the way that Orlando has to guard you. Now you got to pick your poison. If he's going to stretch the four like that, you're going to bring guys like Isaacs off the, uh, out of the paint. You're going to have guys looking at you. Um, and then when they, when they run pick and roll with him, now there's an option for Evan Mobley to pick and pop. Now he can pick it and, and, and he can kind of pop. Or if they want to switch that, he can get a little man on him. And now you can go to work down low. So it's set up the way the Cavs wanted to really work. And when he's able to hit that, it gives Jared Allen more opportunity to get offensive rebounds because he has more space or to get the ball down and work down low. So, you know, he hit those two threes and kind of set the tone for what they was trying to do. And I think off of that, you started to see Donovan Mitchell have a little more space. You started to see other guys have a little more space to drive and kick. Um, in terms of what he's going to do coming out in the, in the second half, it's just, it's just about, I think, Donovan and, and Darius – understanding what they want to do, right? Um, in this game, Donovan was like, okay, I, it's kind of stagnant a little bit. I think I need to take over. But in other games, they may come out and say, look, hey, Evan, you got somebody on you. You're wearing them out. We're going to go down to you the first two or three times. You know what I'm saying? Right. Go to work. So it's just about them seeing that. And when they see that, Earl, then you can work. And, and other people can kind of figure out where they work off that. But I think you need to do a good job of – uh, setting the tone for what the Cavs wanted to do. I think he did a damn good job. I, I think JB Biggerstaff or whoever came up with the game plan of, okay, let's make sure we get Evan Mobley going early uh, to get his confidence boosted. I thought it, I thought that was a, a great game plan to start the game. You come out there, man, and you hit those two threes. Um, it's funny, before I walked over to the game, I was on the radio with Danny Cunningham, and, you know, he said that for him, if Evan Mobley hit 10 threes in this series, hands down the Cavs will win. So he's already hit two. I guess you got eight more to go. I thought that how he asserted himself early on as far as like scoring the basketball, it helped everybody else on the team, you know, as far as floor spacing, helped them do their thing. But even when the scoring stopped in the second half, for him to grab, what, four or five rebounds in the second half, still have those two block shots and just coming up in crucial moments, like he didn't disappear. We've always known Evan Mobley to be inconsistent when it comes to scoring the ball. But the one thing that I got to get a man credit is credit for ever since he stepped foot into this league, he's been a premier defender, right? Yes. And that is that is huge for somebody that young to be that great of a defender in the NBA already. And so I never was really off the Evan Mobley hype train because I think that it's so many different aspects to his game and so many different tools that he has in his toolbox. I think that once we start seeing the scoring come on a consistent basis, every, everybody will be more comfortable about his potential going I, forward. I hope we get to that point. I hope we see it. What's so frustrating about him, and I have to keep reminding myself how young this kid, he's a right. kid, and I have to keep reminding myself of that because sometimes my criticism of him is over the top and mm -hmm. unfair. Now, I say that to say this. I fell off the Evan Mobley hype train 10 games into this season, and here's why. We were told 
he went to the lab with the pen and the pad and was going to come with all these <laughs> low post moves and he was going to recreate. And, yeah. and, and we, we were going to see a different Evan Mobley. I want that so badly. And I really didn't. I saw the same guy. And so for me, the hype train was a bullet train going 500 miles an hour. And I was on it mm-hmm. early on. But now it's kind of like a commuter train and it's going 120 and it stops at a lot of places. And that's where Evan Mobley is to me in his progression. I've seen small steps, him hitting threes with confidence. He had a three, I think it was against Indiana late in the year that was the game-winning shot. Yep. And my mind was blown. I said, that's not the Evan Mobley I know. Against that's Philly. The, Philly, Philly, you're right. That's the, that's the guy I want to see. The guy who's not afraid with the game in the balance to take that 25-foot shot. I was stunned at that. I'll be honest. I was, I was blown away. And the fact that he made it, you could see how much it meant to his teammates. Not in the micro. It was great. They were going to win the game. They were excited about that. But they were also looking at the kid who we were told was going to be a home run hitter, but he hit a lot of doubles, and then he finally hit one over the fence. Right. And we're like, oh, the lid is, yep. you know, yeah. the, the cork is out of the bottle now, and there's no putting it back. And then we saw those two threes early yesterday. And then he just stopped. He just inexplicably stopped. And I want Mike to explain, was that more Cleveland <coughs> deciding we can do other things? Or was that more Orlando saying, we can't survive if he's going to get off like that. So then they put a lot more pressure Jay, and attention on him. Jay, do you believe, he, do you believe that <clears throat> that's a function of him being a big, like he, he doesn't, it's kind of like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have the, he's not a traditional, like, three. Like, you know, if, you get, if you're a three, LeBron and KD or something, you can get the ball and you can take it. Yeah, I, and I know where you're going with this because the ball isn't in his hands right. to start so much that that is, the, the flow of the game is dictated by the point guard. Yes. Right. Who gets the ball, who gets involved. It's up to the point guard to know when someone's got a fever mm-hmm. and you keep, you keep yeah. feeding the fever. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was Donovan or if it was Darius that just wasn't going to him and they weren't forcing him to get involved. I'm not sure what it was. I really want to hear Mike talk about it because I don't know. But for me, like, I fell off the hype train around game 10. Mm -hmm. I still love the guy. I still think he's going to be a very, very good player. What I've moved on from is that he's the unicorn and he's going to be Kevin Durant reincarnated. I uh, have moved on from that. Yeah, yeah, did, and, did. and I'm not back. I, look, if he comes back next year and actually does add some low post moves and he does have a little bit more confidence in the three and can shoot around 35% from three, then, okay, he, he can be that guy. Uh, yeah, I but think right he, now, he's more of a, I think if you, if you, if you told me Evan Mobley can get to 23 and 12. I take it. 23, 12, two blocks. I take it. And he shoots about maybe 32, 33% behind the arc. I think all of that is stuff that, that we would, would take. That would be, that would you be. You get seven or eight more points per game out of him. Right. A three more per game out of him. Yeah. Um, the defense is there. What's, what's crazy about him is defensively, he is a superstar. He is. He is a defensive superstar. To round his game out to where you can say he is a league superstar. Mm. And by that, we mean he can be the guy that in any given moment, in any given series, can say, jump on my back, boys. Right. I'm taking you there. If you, Donovan if, does that. I don't think Mobley is there yet. Th- th- that means any given night, I can give you 30. Right. Need it? You need it tonight? You need 30, I'll reach down and I'll get it. Doesn't right, have to yeah. do it every night. Yeah. Yet. But when you become, it, it, it's like um, in, in national defense, it's strength through power. Mm-hmm. It's if, when you're a threat, nobody wants to bully you. Mm-hmm. And when, when he's a threat and he can beat you multiple ways, the reason he is the golden key that unlocks all of this team's potential is because he's the guy that teams know, oh, we can stop him offensively. We can shut him out. And in, until he gets to the point where he can, on any given night, go for 30, I don't think this team will ever claw, crawl to its highest potential. He's the proverbial, he's with, with the over-cliche X factor. He's the guy, he's the guy, so say for instance, 
He's the guy you play the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you're like, okay, well, what do we got to stop when we play the Cleveland Cavaliers? Well, we know what they got in Donovan Mitchell, and it starts with him. And it right. starts with him. Okay, we, we Jared Allen, he's a he's a hustle guy, put back guy, energy. We we just don't need to let him get 20 rebounds, right? And then you say, okay, well, Darius Garland, he slider frame. We need to be on him in his body. We need to be pushing him. We need to be physical with him. But the guy that you that unlocks all of that is. If Evan Mobley is killing you, then it opens that you can't be physical with Darius Garland. You got to play him one on one. And now Jared Allen might get 20 rebounds because he's 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 operating like that. He makes everyone better. Everybody. He's so, hitting everything. Yeah. So if he they get to, to get to that, Kobe Altman's prize might be right if they could get Mobley right. So Mike, um, I, I'm really going to lean on you here to sh- tell us. X's and O's wise, what was going on? What did Orlando do that worked? Who you think made the best adjustments throughout the game? You know, who would you give the gold star to from a strictly coaching standpoint? How does that all play out? Well, we'll do, so we're going to do some more of this next segment, but we'll focus on just the Mobley stuff here. We'll start with the two threes. After they made the two threes, Donovan and J.B. Bickerstaff both said in the post game, Orlando completely changed how they were guarding the pick and roll. We saw three different looks afterwards. I'm going to show you two of those different looks. Okay. I thought one of them was a really smart adjustment from Jamal Mosley on Orlando's side, which is part of the reason Evan Mobley, his only two shot attempts in the second half were threes. Right. So we'll show you the two threes he made. Then we'll show you two separate coverages Orlando tried to go to to counteract, leaving him wide open. This is great stuff. One of them worked. One of them didn't work, and I'll okay. show you why. So okay. this was the first three he made. Essentially the same two things in both his first threes. See, so you can play the clip whenever you're ready. But they just said, Paolo... You're not have to guard Evan. Leave him open. If he makes threes, he makes threes. It's going to repeat. I'll spot shout out some stuff, but Paolo Bancaro's guarding Evan Mobley. So he's wide open weak side, right? Yeah, he's going to come in. He's going to sag the roll. He's going to go help off Jared Allen. That leaves Evan Mobley wide open in the corner. Step, shoot, make. That's what you got to do. They're going to give you that shot. You got to step up. You got to make it. So that's Donovan drawing all kinds of attention when he penetrates. And Paolo sagging off to help the roll. Right. Paolo sags in a a spot shadow again here, but he's going to be there. Stop Jared Allen. He can't dump it down. That's what you give and take. That's why you need the spacing in the corner. Steve, go to the next one. Darius Garland's the ball handler on this one. Similar situation. Paolo still guarding Evan Mobley. He's going to come down. Evan rotates up. Great rotation. Paolo takes uh, Jared Allen. Suggs should rotate out. Watch how slow and lazy Suggs' closeout is, which essentially tells you the game plan is let him shoot. And, Mike, I like to drift right there. You see how he drifted? Like yeah, great, he relocated. It's a great two steps up. Better passing angle, yep. better shot. So it's just the same thing. They said, Evan, we're going to let you shoot. We're not worried about it. And you could tell by nothing else than Jalen Suggs' half ass close out there. Yeah, They're it not was worried a about terrible Evan close yeah. out. So that was the initial coverage. Then they switched. Steve, go to the next one. They decided we're just going to switch. Now, this is is during their scoring desert right here. Like, this is early second quarter? Early second quarter. This was his, Ah. in my opinion, his best post move ever. Ah. They said, okay, we're just going to switch the pick and roll because we don't think you're going to take us to the post. That's not something the Cavs look for. That's a big little mismatch. You have to attack that every time. That's when Evan needs to be as aggressive, call for the ball. Darius does a great job. Oh, my. We call call that child protective services. (laughs) Somebody go get to somebody. Everybody check on that little boy. Also, look at his ankles. Ah. That's just a great ah. post move. He should score in that situation 10 out of 10 times. Now, also, kudos to Garland for recognizing the huge size mis- mismatch yes. and knowing I've got to get the ball into the paint to Evan. And, and that's where Evan needs to be aggressive. Call for the ball. Asking Darius does a great it. job finding it. So they tried to switch. Now, that was the first adjustment they made. The next one I'm going to show you, Steve, don't take it yet, is a great counter to this. So they just switched, right? Cavs notice it. They say, okay, if you're going to switch, we're going to go right to Evan in the post. Steve, take the next one. This was a great counter here from the Magic. They switch, and they switch again. Gary oh, Harris yeah. was initially guarding. That ends up instead of Evan on Jonathan Isaac. Uh, on Gary no, Harris, Isaac it ends up, up being Jonathan Isaac on Evan Mobley, which is a mismatch for the Cavs in an offensive favor. Yeah. They switch. Harris and Isaac switch at the last second. The ball's already being passed. So Isaac thinks he has a big little mismatch in the post. Well, it turns into a big, big mismatch. Isaac's tremendous in the post. Now, that was a quick little adjustment they made on the fly. Why uh, doesn't Mobley just kick it back to Okoro? I don't think he realized the switch happened. Watch, watch Evan when he catches. He, he turns. He's going to roll. He has Gary on his shoulder. Plant my ass. I'm oh, posting yeah, up his, here. I'm sealing. Right. 
He looks. He seals boom. and turns yeah. around. He doesn't know he's he doesn't there. No, yeah. great little adjustment from Jamal Mosley and the Magic to get the mismatch or mismatch, whatever, big on big. You know what? The though? counter to that, real quick, if you watch this again, is Isaac can't make that pass so quick, and Jared Allen has to flash to the high post, and then you get the big little mismatch of Jared at the high post on Gary Harris, who then switched with Jonathan Isaac. So it's a chess match within the game. This happened so quick. This is why Orlando's really good defensively. They're long, good communication. But, but, but that's but where Jared Allen has to flash to the high post, and you have the two-on-one on the backside. So, so JB has look. to make him aware of that, and uh, Jared Allen, when he sees that switch, they could, he could call it out, and then and, he has to flash. And here's the other thing. There was eight seconds left on the shot clock. Now, I know what you're saying. When he caught the ball in the low post, he had no idea that the switch had happened, so he didn't know that Isaac was on him. But... If you notice, he pivots and dribbles, and he realizes that Isaac's in his face. He doesn't have anything. If you play it one more time, what I'm saying he should have kicked it to Okoro is after he pump fakes, Okoro is standing there. Watch what happens here. So he's going to get it, dribble, pumps right there. He could have. Oh, he definitely could kick it out. He could have kicked it to Okoro and try it again. There's eight seconds left. Reset and try something else. It's not I, a great I'd shot rather, for I'd rather Evan Mobley take that shot than Isaac Okoro. No, I'm not suggesting Okoro <laughs> no, shoot you're right, from there. You're right. just, I, I you've think, got eight seconds. Let Okoro start to trigger something new. Yeah, I think eight seconds is more than enough time to kind of yes. reset. And it's get not a, like it's four a, a, seconds. A better, a better quality four seconds, you shot, don't do it so. because now Okoro does have to shoot the mm-hmm. ball. Yeah. But with eight seconds left, and I, all this is happening so quickly, I agree with Mike. He had no idea the switch happened, but he did know once he put the ball and turned to the hoop, he knew that Isaac was in his face. You know what's so funny, Mike? Back in the day when I was in college, we used to do that same move. We'd be on the dance floor dancing, and all of a sudden, a girl switch. He'd be like, oh, you didn't even know I was dancing with you. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even know I was dancing with you. I was with your friend, but I'm over here with you because you look better. <laughs> switch. Switch. You didn't even know. they like, who is this big? Where's my... Where did you know it. You didn't even know it. Hey, by, the way, know you, it. by the way, you go to jail for that now, dude. Don't do that in 2024. <laughs> now, did you have friends that picked <laughs> you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Listen, I have big... I, my brother was in college. He set the screen. I'm over there. I came free. <laughs> came free with my shoulders ready to shoot, Jay. <laughs> that is a great analogy. Y'all are so crazy. It will be fascinating to see how Orlando <laughs> goes back. Are they going to allow Mobley to shoot again? You made him in game one. Can you make him in game two? Who won the coaching guard? adjustments? I mean, J- JB won. They held him to 83 that. points. Defensively, yeah. they had every answer to what Orlando was trying to do. But we'll see the counters. Game yeah. one is all about in-game adjustments. Now that's on tape. What's the counter to the counter? Yeah. And I'm curious what you guys think will be some adjustments we see tonight. And I'm going to ask you guys that question in just a second. Okay. I went to the Guardians game yesterday, guys. It was a blast. And I used game time to get tickets because there's no easier way to get tickets online, especially for Major League Baseball games, than using the game time map. The game time prices actually get lower the closer you wait to first pitch. So you find the absolute best last-minute deals. The prices on guarantee on the game time map are guaranteed to be the best you'll find anywhere around. They have flash deals, zone deals, all in prices. I saw the view from the seat before I actually paid for them. So I would highly recommend using the GameTime app. You can take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with GameTime. Just download the GameTime app, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, create an account, download code uh, LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. So you had, you just had one hell of a Cleveland sports day yesterday. Cavs game right sports over weekend. the Guardians game. Sports weekend. Sports weekend. <laughs> Not the same day. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. You, so you didn't go Saturday. I went to the Cavs game Saturday, Guardians game Sunday. You did not go to the Ca- Guardians uh, game not, on no. Sunday, uh, Saturday. Uh, I know someone that went Saturday. I know someone that went Sunday. They said yesterday was like going to a game in December. They said it was. It was very cold. Oh, it was yesterday. cold. Freezing cold. Yeah, I asked Mike this morning. I said, "How was the game?" He said, "Cold, cold." It was yeah. Cold. Are you, are you a? You know, you got the Guardians hat on now. You're all in on Cleveland sports teams, right? Are you a de facto Cleveland sports fan yeah. now? Yeah, absolutely. Them winning is good for business. So yes. Yeah, but I think it goes beyond that. I think you're attached to these teams, not just because it's good for our show when they win. I think well, no, you but like yeah, root I, for these teams. They haven't become your teams. When you have to watch a team you that watch, much, they, yeah, you you become not infatuated by them. But I've got relationships with certain players now sure. from, from being like, yeah, absolutely. I um, love that. Let's I, let's talk about game two adjustments though, Earl, because you right. were there game one. Okay. What do you want to see from both the Cavs side in terms of adjustments 
to make sure they leave game two tonight with the same result we saw on Saturday. What do I want to see from the Cavs adjustment wise to make sure that they come away with a two nothing lead? I honestly want to see the Cleveland Cavaliers kind of do a better job on uh, Paolo Ban- Ban- was it Bancero? Yeah, Ban- Carol. Ban- Carol. Carol. I want to see the Cavs do a better job on him. I know he didn't shoot that well from from the field, but he too had a lot of open looks that that he missed. And I think you know the nine turnovers was him like really trying to uh, get others in, involved and things like that. But that dude is a flat out superstar, right? And I think that 24 and seven, I think that he has the ability, you know, to come out and, and be better this game. And so it's going to take the Cavs to actually put more emphasis on locking him down, making sure that, you know, he's not getting to the rim because, you know, he, like I said, he missed a lot of easy shots themselves, right? And the rest was letting, let, letting people play most things that, you know, typically would have been a foul that's going in his direction. Wasn't, I know he missed a lot of free throws as well. And Orlando takes and makes a lot of free throws from the free throw line. And so, like, they do, you know, and they did in game one, right? He didn't play his best game. And I think that JB Bickerstaff needs to go back, watch the tape. I don't even know, Mike, if I would call it an adjustment, just kind of double down on what you did to make sure that that dude don't kill you because that's the only dude on the Orlando Magic that can absolutely yeah. kill you. They are offensively challenged. Yeah. And that I'm being nice. Yeah. He, it, like, if he went for 45, it would be a problem. But outside of that, I just don't see how this team can beat the Cavs in this series. I don't. I, I'm not talking about a game. They can take a game. I yeah. don't see how they can beat us four times. Me neither. With a team that is this offensively challenged. I'm looking at it um, from, from a standpoint of I want to, I'm going to get uh, Darius Garland. Uh, I want to get him back flowing. I, want, I would move him off the ball a little bit. If, if, I'm, if I'm running with Donovan Mitchell and, and Darius and Donovan is the same backcourt, I want to roll with, with Donovan as the main ball handler. I want to see some backside action. I want to see some plays where Darius Garland can come off some screens and, and get some open shots. I don't necessarily believe that you have to have him at the point of attack and two guys blitzing him and he, him getting beat up a little bit. Um, I, that's fine for him to do that when D- Donovan is on the bench getting rest. But I think him as well as Max Struess, they need to do a better job of getting some clean looks for him. Maybe that's out of the timeouts, whether that's, you know, coming off screens, whether it's coming off pin downs. I want to see those guys come off some and get some easy shots without having to go, uh, you know, one on five and, and look to see if they can, you know, get to the rack or dish off. So that and, and then um, the next thing I want to see in this game is you already know it's going to tell me a lot about the energy level they come out. Of here. Are the Cavs going to be focused and say, listen, all they got to do is win one here. We beat them the first game, but if they come out here with a split, now we got a young team going home hungry, thirsty, and, and with a large crowd that, that's ready to get after it. So I want to see how they come out. The first five, ten minutes of the game, you got to come out and you got to make it be known that Orlando, you guys are going to go home 0-2, and this game is not going to be pretty for you. So, so the energy, the effort, the intensity, and then when you get them down, bury them. Because one thing that we, we haven't talked about is Donovan is about 75, 80%. We want that rest. I'm th- you, how much, how good would it be for, for, for Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland look, looks like his back is ailing him just a little bit. How good would it be if you could get, you, get up out of here with a sweep and, and get some time off and, and rest your legs a little bit? So you have to start thinking about little, little things like that. Rest, make sure you come out on, on top, Jay, because I, I, think, I think if they can bury him in this game, you'll see some of that confidence and that luster go away. Right. So when you say sweep, like, uh, like the whole series? The series, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, well, we, we, want, we want to see that. There, I said earlier that uh, things are going to change when it goes south. It will absolutely change. You know, the momentum that I think carried the Cavs to that hot start really propelled them to the win. Mm-hmm. And the home crowd had a lot to do with that. They came out, they were fired up. Mm-hmm. And everybody, including JB, talked afterwards about how we, we made it a point to come out hot. Well, you can take that away in game three. Mm-hmm. Right. That they won't be able to do that. Now, it'll still be the mission. Let's come out and put, put our foot on their throat, start on a 10-2 run, and let's take this home crowd and send them home early. Right. Mm-hmm. So that will be a, a top of mind for the Cavs. But there's a saying in the NBA playoffs, and I've always loved this and I always believed it to be true. The series does not start until the home team loses a game. Mm-hmm. 
you know, right now it's all about holding serve. And if everybody holds serves, then we've got game seven in Cleveland in a week and change. To your point of getting rest, Miami disappointed me a little bit in game one against Boston. Oh, they took they took that. <laughs> now, Boston hit him with that knockout blow early. <laughs> yeah, I was I was kind of surprised. I, I thought, you know, based on what Woo. happened with the, these two teams last year, but Boston is saying the same thing Woo. Cleveland's saying. Last year, we got kidnapped. Yeah. We didn't even know what that we had been taken. Yeah. And we had and we were in a foreign place. <laughs> and that happened to the Cavs last year in the playoffs and it happened to the Celtics last year in the playoffs. Now, it was devastating to us. Yeah. It was soul crushing to Boston. It was embarrassing. Yeah. It was embarrassing. They were supposed to win it all. Yeah. And Miami just came up and said, "No, no, 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 no." Now, maybe the series will play out differently going forward, but I'm kind of looking that that one might be a quick series too. Uh, oh yeah. So the Cavs might not get rest. Not only might they not get rest if the if Boston's a quick one and we end up needing seven, especially with the miles on on Donovan Mitchell. Now you got to play the one and they're fresh and you're tired. And the first you can't two have games that. in Boston. So I know what you're doing here is you're oh, trying a, to look ahead. Oh yeah, that's my calculus. But that's how you win chess. Yeah. yeah. If you don't play three moves ahead when you're playing chess, the game's over pretty quickly. And I suck at chess. Because I only focus on one thing at a time. I'm in the moment. That's all I can do. <laughs> and and the reason I always get my ass handed to me in chess is because I'm playing. Someone says, "Oh man, I I set that up three moves ago," and I'm like, "Yeah, I wasn't even I wasn't paying attention for that." You know, when when we talk about basketball, you you mentioned this series going back to Orlando, and we won't have the luxury of having our home court home court crowd. Right. And you know, when you're at home, that's when role players do their thing and they play mm-hmm. better. And so another thing that I would like to see in game two. You know, JB went nine deep. I think he, I think Merrill played what four minutes. Yeah, didn't Mike play said, much. Uh, Mike said, you know, those first half minutes from Levert didn't look too good. So oh, that JB out. gave him some run. I kind of want to see more from from our role players, right? Right. From Levert, from we're gonna from need Niang, them. Like we're going to need those, man. Shout out to George Niang too. Like I think he hit and made one three point shot, but he the cast was plus thirteen with him on the court. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And so, like, I just need more from those two guys in particular right. from a scoring standpoint. And then, like, more so with Levert, because Levert is another guy that can be, a, like, on the ball. Right. You know what I'm saying? Guard. And I think it does wonders Man. for getting the ball out of Darius Garland's hands and helping him get some more shots up that's, as well. That's a great point. Um, when they were 18-2, and two, they were getting cont- contributions from everybody. You know, that, and now much of that stretch was without Mobley and it was without, without Darius. But Merrill stepped up and became a force. Yeah, yeah, he was. Like, a, he was a at ball some player. point in these playoffs, we're going to need him to step up and be a oh. force. So, really, to answer your question, what do you change? It's not a, a different note on the pregame sheet. It's just make your damn threes. If this team shot yesterday, what they shoot in the regular season from three point range, they win by twenty five and. The game is never in question. They got it. They, it was like a 14-point lead in the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden it was like six. Yeah. And that's what happens when you miss a couple of possessions in a row and the other team hits a couple of buckets. Next thing you know, the, the thing can flip on you really quickly. Make your three-pointers. Yeah. It, it's a make-it league. It's a three-point league. The Dang. playoffs are here now. You're going to need Merrill to be hot, Nyang to be hot. You're going to need Max Strus to be hot. If those guys shoot well from three, they are going to be a very, they, very yeah. difficult They out. need, like, and, and, and I know a lot of people think that we tough on Darius Garland or whatever. And then people that all have even hinted to that we have some sort of agenda on Darius Garland. The reason we talk about Darius Garland so much is we understand that the Cavs are not going to be able to, to win certain games if they don't have Darius Garland giving you 20. We need to pencil him in for 20. Because we just got to talk about the role players. We don't know what we're getting from Struess or Mero or Niang. We don't know. what We can't pencil that in in the playoffs from game to game what they're going to get. What you get from them, especially on the road, is a bonus. But from the guys, the, the main dudes, it's the two guards. The core four. The core four, right? And more so, the guys who have the ball. Darius Garland is traditionally a 20-point-plus guy a, a game. We need to pencil him in for 20 and about five assists and two turnovers. Not five, two. We can deal with two. Right. This is, you know, these games come down to possessions, especially late in games. 
We can't throw the ball away, and we got to know, and he's going to have to be aggressive. When we go to Orlando, we talk about kind of looking ahead a little bit. They got to take care of business tonight, obviously. But when you get to Orlando, he has to be super uber aggressive. If he goes 0 for 30, who cares? On the road, your stars have to be aggressive, and you live in, and you live and die with what they're going to do. Yeah, we've been talking as if tonight is in the bank because of the way game one went. You know, you, you dramatically change the mood, the outlook, the feel. If you lose one, because Orlando's mission was simple coming to Cleveland. We've got two to win one. Right. And there's no back against any wall yet because they know they're going to get their home games. But if for some reason... The Cavs take their foot off the gas. What's the recipe? And Orlando sneaks out with a dub. What, what is the recipe and, and for Orlando? I don't like the, the way this thing goes. What, what's the recipe for Orlando getting the upset? I, well, number one, they have to do something that they just traditionally don't do, and that's make three-pointers. They've got to score. Because this Cavs team, even though they went through a 10-minute scoring desert, yeah. they, they still damn near hit 100 points against a really good defensive team. So the one thing that the Orlando Magic can do is force the Cavs to turn it over. There's two things. Force them to turn it over at the rate they did in game one. And also, hit eight more three-pointers. Even if you hit eight more three-pointers, that's 24 points. Yeah. They won by 14. So, uh, and and that's doable. They shot, what, 11%? Yeah, it was terrible. I would expect Orlando's adjustment would move Suggs from guarding Darius to Donovan. Leave Isaac on Jonathan. Uh, leave Isaac on Jared Allen, and oh. that forces the Cavs to make a choice. Do we want to run pick and roll with Donovan and Jared against arguably two of the five best defenders in basketball? I think that opens things up for mobile. Or then we have Darius and Evan be the initiators of our offense against Gary Harris and Paolo. And with Paolo, they use drop coverage almost exclusively in the first game. And Darius did a couple of good things against drop coverage. So I think that's the adjustment. I also think we'll see Orlando ramp up the pressure and stop giving Donovan as much space to operate. They let him have a couple, especially early. They gave him space, which allowed him to get going. And then once he made a couple shots, Donovan's in the zone. It's hard to get him out. So I think their two adjustments, switching the guard matchup, sucks to, Don- to Donovan and not giving Donovan nearly as much space to operate. But at the end of the day, Orlando took 30 free throws and scored 83 points. God. Like, that is they missed. truly a pathetic offensive that- performance. They'll be better tonight because they, I don't think it's possible to be worse. But I don't know how they're going to create offense. They want to get to the paint. And when you can play Jarrett and Mobley together because of the matchups on the other end of the court, especially if like, Evans making shots, it's tough to score on those guys. The reason that's such a scary stat is because Orlando does like to score with the clock stopped. And they do. Yeah. And I think that, that, is, that that's something that they can put in their bank. Like, they know that that's in their DNA. They're going to get that night to night to night to night. The thing that they made 30 free throws. They took 30. They took 30. They, 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 they was 19 to 30. Okay, they shot like 63%. Which is a terrible percentage. Right, they shot 63%. Correct. They're not um, going to do that But again. the fact that they got thir- they had 30 trips w- in a road playoff game that we all agree was loosely called. Yeah. Um, that's crazy to me. And the other, So if they scored 19 points with the clock stopped, that means that they I'm scored 64 points in 48 minutes of basketball. It was a horrific... They'll be better tonight. They can't, they can't be, worse. be worse. But at the end of the day, let's make our picks real quick. I'm sticking with the Cavs. They're a better team. I am too. Donovan's the best player in the series. He looks healthy. And at home with the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse crowd behind him. I, I'm I'd saying, be surprised if the Cavs don't what's win What's the number the Cavs reach tonight? I'm saying they win and they score 110. Mm. I go 104. Okay. They win with 104. <laughs> uh, that's tough. I, I think they get... I think this final score, one, 102... 89. So you got 104. Uh, got you got 110. 110. You got 104. You got 102. I got the cast with 100 on the dot. Okay. I got 100 on the dot. I say 100 to about 89. Man, right, Earl, you, you, don't, you pull the prices right. You're going to say yeah, $1? You, 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 yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> price is right. Hey, $1. Oh, he got their bids hey. and he comes in. He's like, yo, hey, over. I'm going like, to $1. $1. Listen, listen, old and price is right. And the actual retail <laughs> price is $1 flat. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Earl's running up on that stage. <laughs> and you're like, what just happened? He's shouting out all his people. Yeah, well, listen. And then, then they're going to give him a, a, a game like Plinko. <laughs> <laughs> There's no skill in that. It went $25,000. And get both showdowns when he gets in them. 
Man, for, all you, for all you young guys, they don't know. you don't know. Don't Check know. it out. Check it out. Tip off tonight, 7 p.m. on NBA TV and <laughs> Bally's. We will have a post-game show at some point tonight. It's not going to be immediately after the game, but we'll have some sort of 20, 25-minute recap. Nice. Coming up, so make sure you guys tune in. Appreciate everyone who tuned in on Saturday for that one. We're going to pivot topics here, guys, in a sec. But first, we know Anthony's a competitive person. He played soccer, and if you piss him off, he gets very upset. So I've learned not to piss him off while playing Monopoly Go. He's yeah, competitive, wow. and he's a huge fan of Monopoly Go. He's one of the 150 million people who have downloaded the great app. It's a twist on Monopoly, but you can play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you money. The best part? Messing with his friends. Anthony can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly. He can also rob their vaults for riches for himself. And the leaderboards show Anthony who the biggest Monopoly tycoon truly is. But it's not just his competitive side that loves it. He can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get it on the game. Join today and download Monopoly Go, which is free on the App Store or Google Play. Jay, we're going to skip the NBA playoff recap. We'll do that later if we have time, if not for overtime. But let's okay. talk a little NFL draft because the NFL draft is right around the corner. Dane Brugler was supposed to join us today from The Athletic. Unfortunately, he has strep throat. And that is not Ooh. a great time for a draft expert like <laughs> Dane Brugler to get strep throat. So we're wishing Dane a speedy recovery. But we're still going to do a little mock draft Monday here. I accompanied and uh, compiled. A company made no sense. I don't know what the hell that was. I compiled <laughs> some of the best two-round mock drafts from around the interweb and came to a bit of a consensus here that is a very different than what I expected it to be a few weeks ago. So I went through and I found six different two-round mock drafts because the Browns obviously don't pick till number 54. And a few weeks ago, we all thought offense was the pick, right? A receiver, maybe a running back, a tight end. Steve, let's take this full here. That's not necessarily the case anymore. Dane Brugler, in his latest seven-round mock draft, had the Browns taking Mason Smith, the defensive tackle out of LSU. Ryan Wilson, CBS number one draft guru, also had the Browns taking Mason Smith. PFF had Chris Jenkins, the Michigan defensive tackle, go into the Browns at 54. Chad Reuter of NFL.com had the Browns taking Edrin Cooper, the linebacker out of Texas A&M. And Walter Football had them taking Jonah Ellis out of Utah, who I'll be completely honest. I've never heard of it in my life. That could be a fake name, but I did Google to check. It is real. <laughs> so those were five players that people who are in the know or at least are more knowledgeable on these situations than I thought could be the pick for the Browns at 54. After I made that list, Steve Take Tagboard full. Zach Jackson, who joined us in studio last week, did his mock draft, and he had the Browns taking the receiver out of Oregon, Troy Franklin, at 54. So there's the offensive pick. We thought it was offense for a couple weeks even months leading up to this point. It is now Monday of draft week. Do you think defense is actually the way Andrew Barry and the team goes, or are you still sticking to your guns that an offensive player will be the Browns' first selection at 54? I'm insisting it's going to be a wide receiver. I think it's going to be a defensive player. Now, I, I will say this. Um, it looks like a lot of guys are following the breadcrumbs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that general managers are so good at dropping before the draft. The fact that so many of these reporters have pivoted from wide receiver to defensive tackle or defensive line tells me that they're talking to people within the organization and people within the organization that are talking to these people are appropriately mis misdirecting them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I will say this. Mm -hmm. There is almost no significant advantage to be gained at this point by dropping fake bread breadcrumbs, but you do it out of habit. You just figure that when the last down is played of the season, as a general manager, you say, okay, on this day, I turn into Pinocchio. Yep. And I don't tell the truth until the day after the draft. And that's just the way it is. And I think that they have to take a wide receiver. In your vein of Operation Stockpile, mm -hmm. last year, they stockpiled the defensive front. Yep. Check. Good. Miles Garrett is there. Miles Garrett is a better pass rusher than any wide receiver we have. And because of that, that still is your area of need. And they can't draft a receiver in the third round because they end up pumping gas after two years. <laughs> So, I, I just think the higher you move up the board, 
the more likelihood you are to hit at any given position. I will throw this into the mix. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even rule out the Browns moving up, and I know that's not what they do. But if they think that there's a receiver that's there at 44 but won't be there at 54, and they think that that's the guy that fits their system and that's the need that they have, I wouldn't put them. I wouldn't put it past them packaging a couple of later round picks to go up 10 to get the player that they think won't be there at 54. It's funny you say that because, you know, Mike got me on this whole NFL.com mock draft simulator that I have not been able to put down. It is so and, fun. Oh, it's, and it's so it's quick. And, and like every single mock draft, if they get a wide receiver, I think they're going to have to trade up because it's like it's almost like what? Six to ten wide receivers is coming off the board before the Browns get there at 54. Now, the, now if they stay in pack at 54, I don't think they're going to take a wide receiver. Well, because this is why. When we, and you we, might be right, by the way. When, if if when, they don't think they've got somebody that is a difference maker at 54, right. they might go to another position. I, I know we've been screaming, like, like, JG, we've been screaming wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver. But the, the truth of the matter is that rookie wide receiver is not going to have an impact on this year's team no matter what. And even if the, the, whoever the wide receiver is is good enough to kind of jump Cedric Tillman or David Bell on the depth chart, I still don't think like they're going to play a significant amount of time unless somebody get hurt or they're going to have a significant impact. And the reason why I say that is because when you look at this roster, it's ready-made. Andrew Barry just talked about bringing rookies in here for them to have little to no impact immediately. If anything, you groom those guys to be starters or significant role players two or three seasons down the line. The reason why I think the pick is going to be on the defensive side of the ball is because I think when you talk about Andrew Barry doing, uh, going about this best player available, I think all the best players available will, will be either on the defensive line or linebacker. I know a, a lot of the mock drafts I did, I keep coming up with the linebacker from Alabama being available for the Browns at 54. Now, Alabama, I mean, linebacker is not a big part of the Cleveland Browns defensive scheme but it's also a position to where you really don't have a lot of depth there. And so if you can get a young guy that's athletic that you can groom and to have him as that role player, uh, maybe a season or two seasons from now, you do that. Because look, think about it. A guy like Jacob Phillips that they drafted to, to, to play a significant role never really did anything here, right? And so we talk about the guy that's being mocked to the Browns right now at 54, the Mason Smith kid, right? I instantly thought, okay, well, you drafted Perry on Winfrey a couple years ago. That didn't work out. So maybe this is you trying to do that again. I well, just think on the Alabama so- linebacker edge, Mac Wilson didn't work out either. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Well, it, if you guys don't know, I'll tell you what you should Please be tell me what's going to happen. What are we taking? Man? I mean, listen, first and foremost, there, there is no other choice that you should be taking Andrew Berry other than a wide receiver. Namely, because Amari Cooper, guess what? You don't know what he's doing next year. You might pay him, you might not. Uh, Elijah Moore, you might pay him, you might not. Chances are you might not. David Bell is a guy, and, and, and your boy Cedric Tillman is a guy until proven otherwise. I can't keep coming in here and talk about his body is big. Super pause. But, I, you know, I can't just keep coming here and talk about Cedric Tillman. These prospects, Keon Coleman, Troy Franklin, Xavier Leggett, and Ricky Pearsall are better than Elijah Moore right now. Today. Wow. Today. Keon Coleman, six, this dude is six foot say, five. Say, say that again. Say, go, go. These guys are better than Elijah Moore today. Xavier Leggett, better than him today. Right now. Now, my, part, my thing is this. I, when, I watched, when I watched Elijah Moore play yesterday, last year, he was not a difference maker. Was he? No, he was not. Uh, I, we, hey, we, they try to, they try to make him the second coming of Percy Harvard. We're gonna give him reverses. We're gonna do all. No, 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 no. Titus you know, was the leader uh, of that gang. No, he was, he was serviceable. They probably are not going to bring him back. But you telling me Troy Franklin and Xavier Leggett can't play today? Sure they will. And by the way, you heard what you heard what Kevin Stefanski said. He said we're gonna be aggressive and in a big way. Six hundred and forty yards, and they play a hundred games. <laughs> They play many. They play eighty six games like the NBA, and he got six hundred forty yards. No disrespect, but what, and, you, and so what my thing is, I'm looking at these receivers, and it's one of the best receiver classes of all time. You are going to get somebody to fall to you in the second round, and let's talk about these picks that's minimal. What about Jerry Rice's kid? I, I'll take him too. His stock is risen. I, I like him. 
But you said they got a third, a fifth, they got a couple fives, right? Yeah, I th- I could see them moving a couple fives or a five and a six. Hey, they can. You know what? I'm I'm I, you know I'm hyperbole. I'm the, I'm the Duke of New York. They can have every one of them fifths and six round picks. All of them. You want them? Take them. You get the two fives, the two six. This is like this is this. You gonna get a t-shirt? Oh, so you're talking about moving up into the first round if you give that if you give up four picks? Hey, listen. I don't. Them picks. I will agree with Earl said. Them picks that he had, they got. They ain't making a team. This defensive tackle, we we tried to see Aki Ika. Why are we gonna take another defensive tackle? Are we assuming he can't play? No, you're right. We just took another defense. So I'm gonna get up and get a D tackle right. to sit him behind Siaki Ika. No, I need somebody that's gonna be able to get downfield, catch the football, and be part of this this Deshaun Watson passing attack. I just, with think, I just think that's a bold take, man, to say that them dudes right now is better than oh, Elijah Moore. I, I, Listen, I get it. Elijah Moore didn't live up to the potential last season. Or but the year before. I, or the year before. <laughs> okay, so what about the Jets game? Like, what about the Jets game? He looked good. With, like, he looked good. Out Everybody there. looked good. The Jets game. <laughs> he looked good out there. They had the other team talk about the atmosphere. They said the first. <laughs> Hey, listen. First quarter of the Jets listen, I, I was spooked. Was the best quarter I'm of the Jets offense we've I, ever I'm, seen. I'm, I'm buying Elijah Moore stock. I'm with Tyvis. I'm buying more Elijah Moore You're stock. You're buying than, more. I gotta buy more. Some more. more? Maybe more. I'm crazy. Maybe I'm being a homer. Whatever Ooh. the case may be, I just don't believe that Ooh. year two playing under like the Kevin Stefanski system. That granted, that's about to change with Ken Dorsey, but just year two in this organization, man, in this system with this team, I just think it'll be a better season for him. Typically, when we see wide receivers change teams, that first year on that new team for that wide receiver is typically a struggle. Like if you just go back and watch the wide receivers that that's changed yeah, team. What about over the last couple of years with his old quarterback in New York? I thought, oh, oh yeah, that don't that don't, doesn't matter. <laughs> that don't matter. matter. I, that don't matter. I thought they'd have chemistry. I, I just think I think he's going to have a better season, and I think a lot of his his attitude, his mindset, like all of that is in the right place, right? Even with his, the season not going the way that we thought or he thought last year, he was still he, more mature. He was still more mature. It. He he never really like he, he was locked in on this thing being about the entire team. And I think if he keeps that mentality, I think this year will be better for him. Think about David Njoku, right? David talked about how he used to go into TV, like you know what I'm saying, trying to make the Pro Bowl, like try, trying to check off all of these. And once that mindset changed and it just locked on, okay, about let's get the Cleveland Browns to the playoffs. He had a career year, and um, I, I just think that Elijah Moore is going to have a much better I hope you're season. Right, man, and he I, better grow three, four inches too. He's not going to do that because <laughs> he's going to do that. I think I think he gets one more year. <laughs> he gets, I mean, might get, he might get. They draft a receiver. He's going to get half a year. Because here's the reality, right? Judy already got the contract extension. We both. I think we can all agree. That's Elijah right. Moore and Cooper are both not getting new deals. No, no, I don't right? see how they can. And no. so, so if, how you feel about? Okay, like, that so hurt his heart. All right, so. If, if Elijah Moore comes out here and balls out, right? Amari Cooper is approaching 30 years old. Sure. He are you not going to give? Whoa, whoa. You, now you, that's the take. That's you, the one you clip. Uh, are you not? Earl so, Pearl has saying, Elijah Moore. Oh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, no, he, it was I, didn't, if. I didn't say that. But you know what I always say to if. <laughs> if if was a fifth. <laughs> no, we, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bike. I, uh, so, uh, that's the question I'm getting to. That's is, a big leap. Are, are you saying that you're going to just let him walk in free agency? Like if you if you had to choose between okay if Elijah Moore balls out this year what, right what's and they ball, both yeah, what, 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 yeah, what is that what is that number what he got six forty last year I need double that okay if he go I I can't go up to twelve twelve he not going for twelve Jay listen that's balling if, out if he go eight let's say if he go two hundred yards more than that and he scores he's three got more seventeen touchdowns. games to get twelve hundred yards a th- so th- you said he get a thousand I'm saying he let, let's go a thousand is not balling no, out let's anymore. go let's go let's go let's go eleven eleven hundred. 1100. Okay, that's a difference maker. Oh, you gonna give me the DPJ numbers? You, you, you said I heard eight. I say 900. Eight, eight, 850, 900 yards. That's not balling out. It's not, bo- it it's not <laughs> balling out. You're gonna you're gonna show the door to Amari Cooper. I'm not showing the door to Amari Cooper. What I'm just saying is Elijah Moore is young. If he if he goes for like 900 yards and he scores a couple more touchdowns, I just don't see Andrew Barry letting him walk. I don't. Now look, hey, Earl like Project Stockpile. I don't know. They might restructure some people. They may bring them back. I don't know what kind of stockpile. I didn't get that memo, but it. I, I, I mean, name. <sighs> look, I get the. I get the, the age thing is more attractive, but I need production. Yeah, I, and mean, I don't need DP. I'm not on saying his best year production. And, and yeah. I'm not saying I'm letting Amari Cooper walk. All I'm saying is, is all things equal, and you know Amari is approaching that. 
that age threshold to where you possibly have to move on and mm-hmm. Elijah Moore turns out to have a pretty good year, are you still letting him walk? Well, you know what? It all depends on what Amari Cooper does. Does he stay healthy? Does he have even close to the kind of year he had last year? If he does, I'm not ready to turn the page on that. If, he, if, if he got them, if he got the numbers you're talking about, Deshaun Watson must have threw for that 5,000. So you bringing them both back then? Who? Amari and, uh, and Elijah Moore. If they both have good years, are you bringing them both back? Um, mm. Yeah. They both have great years. You not gotta, good years, great years. They got, you got to ask Deshaun, too, because he got to get some. I like what now. Jay did. <laughs> if they got to have Desha- great years. Yeah, not good years. Hey, yes. now, now, listen. <laughs> great. I want great. Deshaun's going to have to restructure then if they won't bring both of them back. Well, and I imagine that's on the table. Yeah. And, gee, not just those two, but Nick Chubb, too, potentially, which is who we're going to talk about in a quick second, it's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And shout out to the Brown Chernot, by the way, for hitting a winning ticket over the weekend. He had a bonus $5 bet. Bet on Josh Naylor to hit a home run. And Josh Naylor delivered. Turned 5 bucks into $26 on a bonus bet. So a free bet. Hit the Brown Chernot with a nice little dinner for one. So shout out to the Brown Chernot for uh, sending in that ticket. Keep sending us your tickets. And while we're on the topic of FanDuel, Jay. By the way, on Naylor's home run, I loved. I loved. We'll, his we'll talk about it. We're gonna get to it. Don't awesome. worry. It's coming up. This so I want to get this in quickly so we can spend plenty of time on the Guardians. FanDuel put out their AFC rankings for starting running backs in 2024. And Steve, you can take tag board. Full here. Nick Chubb came in at number four, behind Brees Hall, number one, Derrick Henry, number two, and Jonathan Taylor, number three. We don't know if Nick Chubb will be healthy for Week One. We do not know what Nick Chubb will look like when he comes back from his knee injury. But Earl, I'll start with you. Is it disrespectful to put Nick Chubb at fourth based on the player he's been for the last half decade, or is that fair considering the uncertainty around Nick Chubb heading into the 2024 season? I think it's overly disrespectful to put Nick Chubb at fourth because the only reason you're doing it is because the man is coming off an injury, right? But if, you, if you're if you basing this list, what is this off of what? It's for 2024. Like, but, but like, so you're projecting. You're projecting, right? Okay, yeah. even if you're projecting – I still, I, I just have confidence that Nick Chubb is going to be back, and I think he's, he, he's going to do what Nick Chubb does. I don't know if he'll be ready for week one or not, but I think whenever he does hit that football field, he's going to be ready to go. At the end of the day, I still think Nick Chubb is one of the better backs, if not the best back, outside of Christian McCaffrey in the entire NFL. And I get it, he's coming off the injury and things like that, but nothing that we've heard leads me to believe that like he's behind schedule on his timetable to return and I don't know maybe it's just because it's Nick Chubb I just have faith that this dude is gonna come out here and he's gonna boil out I mean to have a guy like Jonathan Taylor um and and Brees Hall in front of him I don't know if you want to put Derrick Henry in front of him Derrick Henry or OG I can I can respect that you know what I'm saying the proof is in the pudding but for those other two dudes I can't see those those dudes being ahead of him Man, I, I, it ain't really disrespectful. It's disrespectful. I think it's like, all right, you know, we don't know he's going to come back and what he's going to look like. You know what I'm saying? Now, now, I will say this. I mean, this is not his first knee surgery, and he tore multiple ligaments. As a matter of fact, he tore so many ligaments, they had to do two separate surgeries to, on his knee. So, it is Nick Chubb, and, I, and I, if anybody else can do it, it's Nick Chubb. And I will say one of the reasons why I think he will come by, back good, and I think he will come back competitive, and Jay can tell, speak to this, one of the first things that they want to do when you have an ACL surgery is make sure that your hamstrings and your quad strength is up to, up to strength. Mm-hmm. You, and when you look at his hamstrings and his quads, you just go back and look how he squats. And when he squats, he squats below parallel. He's squatting big weight. He, he he didn't have much atrophy in terms of what his quad strength and his hamstring strength are, which is, is going to protect you from 
those sudden cuts, those it, 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 it gives you a little more um, shock absorbing when you when you move in and you cut. And that's the thing that we talk about with him. It's his vision, is his jump cuts, is his ability to see backside and put his foot in the ground and get back two, three holes backside and make a guy mix. He, and you know, th those are what makes Nick Chubb special. And when you're doing these lists, what, what people are thinking about is he's a guy that you can very rarely tackle one on one. He's elusive, he's powerful, and he can run away from you. When you got a knee injury with that many ligaments, you're questioning whether or not he still is going to be Nick Chubb. Now, that's fair to say. If they had him outside of the top 10, I would say you're crazy. But at four, I think that's just all injury, nothing to do with his skill set. I think that's what they're worried about, Jay. Yeah, I agree. Earl, I hate to disagree with you because, you know, I love your opinions and I love the way you come at stuff. But I don't think it's disrespectful at all. I think it's using past experience and past players to kind of figure out where he is. Now, there's no guarantee he'll be ready for week one. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I like the fact that we haven't heard anything about his rehab. Yes. Great. Yes. I, I like that. Don't give us false hope. Because when I heard Deshaun Watson talk about his shoulder, he's like, oh, yeah, man, I'm fine. It's great. It's great. Then I heard Andrew Barry talk. And I'm like, man, Andrew Barry's talking about a different shoulder. You know, he's like, well, you don't know how these things are going to be talking about this. One. <laughs> and what's weird is I, I honestly believe that Andrew Barry was trying to pull the horse yeah. back into the yeah, barn yeah, yeah. a little bit because look what we did. Well, we all oh, well, if Deshaun's 100%, we're going to win Super Bowl yep. we're win playoffs. And Andrew's basically been around the block and he's like, look, bro, don't heap more hay on your back than you can carry. Oh, they probably had a meeting. They had and a meeting. I think after they that. had a call <laughs> and Andrew put, dialed back expectations. <clears> and I like that. I like that. We haven't heard from Nick Chubb, and I bet we won't. But the thing of it is, and you know this, it's an injury unlike any other. It literally is. It is. It's, it's the holy grail of injuries. No two ACLs are the same. No mm -hmm. two ACL surgeries are the same. And no, AC, no two ACL comebacks are the same. The good news is he had this when he was at Georgia, mm -hmm. and he bounced back. Mm -hmm. Great. And if you look at that video from when he blew up his that, knee in Georgia, that was crazy. it looked just as cringeworthy as the Ugh. Mika Fitzpatrick hit. Uh, it's, it's nauseating to think about, about actually what happens to your knee when you tear your ACL. The corresponding muscles, because ligaments are what they are. You don't strengthen them. They are what they are. The corresponding muscles are what determine how you come back. Here's the good news. Some surgeries that where you can do work even though the injury is had they call it prehab so that's kind of a new thing doctors say mm -hmm. you know i want you to strengthen the muscles around it without you know you you can't injure the, the, the you know you couldn't do that with the acl he needed to have surgery even though there was a cooling off period mm -hmm. but his prehab is his body and the condition it was in when the injury happened his muscles are superhuman he is barry sanders adrian peterson 2.0 Okay, he's just a freak of nature. So because of that, his atrophied leg is in better shape than 99% of any human on this planet when they're in peak shape. Even after he's atrophied for months after the surgery and he's done nothing. So that's his base. That's his starting point. His starting point is better than most people's finishing point. And his work ethic, his desire to be great, all of that bodes well for him. But they don't know Nick Chubb like we know Nick Chubb. They turn on the TV and they see his highlights and they're like, wow, that dude can run. We've gotten to know <clears throat> Nick Chubb over the six years he's been here. Yes, we have. We've gotten to know him as a quality human being who quietly goes about being the best in the world. And that's what he's spent every single day doing since his surgery. And think about this. And yeah. so we believe he'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't rank him we, for we, it, yeah. but we, I can't kill them and, for ranking and, and, him for and, it. And that, I guess that's where my fandom... They don't know what we that's know. That's where my fandom really took over because they don't know what we know. And, and that's fair. And, and you know, sometimes like you could just have these thoughts and you don't really have no facts to back it up. But everything you just said is why I felt like he was being disrespected because how well... I feel like I know Nick Chubb, right? Yeah. We know, we know him, right? Yeah, they we, don't. We, I remember the Pivot uh, uh, podcast he did with Ryan Clark and them last year. Yep. And he talked about, like, you know, when the running back position, the, the, the talk was you can replace Nick Chubb. 
Nick Tubb has said he's always worked his ass off to make sure he can't be replaced. Right. That he's not just any old back that you can just replace him with. I, I remember saying some years ago, like, he reminds me so much of Adrian Peterson, like how he plays football, how he carries himself, like everything. And because of how Adrian bounced back from his knee injury. Eight months. I believe, I just believe this is the same mold of football player. I think this is the same mold of, of man. And I, I go back to the point of we've seen a medicine and technology and everything just continues to advance and advance and advance and advance. You know, and when you hear Andrew Berry talk about some of the things with Nick Chubb, it's kind of almost like he got to sit this boy down. You tell him to go sit down somewhere, go chill out. So he's clearly chopping at the bit to get back out here, you know, and, and to just get things back on track. And I, th- I think it's going to be a solid season whenever he's back. I think yeah. it's going to be a solid season. I agree with that. I think when he is on the football field, he will be close to the version of Nick Chubb we've seen in the past. I'll give you two names. I, Marshawn Lattimore, I don't know if people remember how great he was. If you were, you were a historian of the SEC and how he, he was dominant at uh, South Carolina, he was, he was supposed to be that type of guy. Um, Darren McFadden yep. was supposed to be that type of guy. You take a, take a look at and I think always remember, and, and my, my, my thing is remember how good Ty Gurley was. Right. Gurley was – Thousand yard receiving, thousand yard, twelve hundred yards. He just he he. You know you know Ty Gurley is not even thirty years old. I know, but they and ran his doors off. They man. did, but that's how it is with knees. Knee, when you get a knee injury, and the thing that and, and you don't want to put this on nobody, but it's it's the it's the degenerative factor when they go in multiple times, right? You start to see the cartilage. Yep. You start to see the swelling, the scar tissue, the scar that tissue that you can't do. Anything can't do about. Any, you know your knee swells after practice, and, and it's that's the most frustrating thing to anybody. I mean, I've had two ACLs. I've torn my PCL and my patella tendon. It's just the fact that you can't, you can't play back. You can't go the back to back stuff that you used to do. You can't. You have to take days off, and it's just it's frustrating because you're not getting better then. You're just maintaining that level uh, of play because you can't practice and sometimes you can't, you know, you might be week to week. So my thing is I hope he doesn't have any of that right now. The great thing about it is I think the Browns did a really good enough job. And by the way, we just talked about the draft. I wouldn't I wouldn't throw it out the window that they draft a running back. I, I think they, you know, when you got a guy like, uh, you know, uh, Nick Chubb, you don't want to force him back. Hey, week six, put him on that, put him on the pup list and, and figure out what you can do. Right. I wouldn't force him back. I think because of the time he had the injury, it was early September. Yeah. So you start doing math forward. If you, now I know this is not fair to him, but he's the, 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 the closest comparison I have to Nick is Adrian Peterson. And when he tore his ACL and was playing in games eight months later, it ruined it for everybody that ever had ACL surgery after that because the, the, the time frame was always 12 months. Right. And when Adrian came back in eight, everybody's like, what? Oh, well, hey, medicine's getting better. You can now come back in eight. No, you can't. But if anyone can, it would be Nick Chubb. You know who messed And you up. know where we are right now? He did it in sep- early September. Yeah. September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. We're eight months exactly post tear. Hey, McNuggets, you know what? You know who messed it up for everybody it was John Elway. You know he doesn't have ACLs. Yeah, I've heard players that have torn ACLs didn't have them replaced and continue to play. Crazy, right? Like he don't have ACL. Right? No, he ain't got no ACL. He has ACLs removed. <laughs> he just doesn't have them. Like yeah, I, I think, think either you're, you're he born tore... with them, you get them removed though. Yeah, I don't you think get it. born without ACLs. You get, you get injured. He Who knows? You're born without digits. Hands. I mean, that's a good point, actually. I, I, that's a dumb statement. Somebody fact check that too. <laughs> yeah, I don't I know look... if that's completely true though that he doesn't have ACLs. I, I'll look into it while we're talking Guardians. Okay, <laughs> we've got to spend the last 20 minutes talking about the red hot Cleveland Guardians. And if you're looking to get Guardians tickets, you better be using the Game Time app. If you ever had a frustrating time buying tickets online, especially if it's a Major League Baseball game, the only answer. And the reason why you had such a frustrating time is because you weren't using Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, 
and their lowest price guarantee makes game work game time the best place to buy your Major League Baseball tickets. So take all the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, create an, adout, an account, redeem code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, True. lowest prices, <laughs> guaranteed. And Jay, those Cleveland Guardians are cooking up something special over at Progressive Field right now. It is incredible and impressive what they have done to start the 2024 season. Yeah, it's beyond impressive um, because they have the best record in baseball. And they're like five or f- I think five games over the LA Dodgers who spend $8 for every dollar the Guardians spend or something absurd like that. Um, what they're doing is gathering a lot of attention across baseball. A lot of the pundits, when I talk to my friends in the national media, they say, uh, talk to me at the All-Star break. And they also say, you know, you have to look at who they've done this against. And that is a fair criticism. Uh, But when they played one great team so far, they lost that series. The great team they played were the New York Yankees, and that's the only series they've lost this year. They dropped two of the three games to the Yankees, but they could have won two or three. Um, They lost a close one. And I I still want to pump the brakes on, you know, I, I still don't think that's, this is who this team is. I think they're above average team. I think that they are going to contend in the central. Um, but man, I look at their starting pitching and it, it's terrifying um, because I'm not sure how long we're going to have Tristan McKenzie. He just doesn't look like the same. And I saw what happened with my own two eyes last year when they pitched much of the season without Bieber and McKenzie. They finished 10 games under 500. And they struggled uh, with, with their starting pitching. And I don't know who's next. I don't know who's coming in the pipeline. But you don't apologize for beating the Oakland A's. You don't apologize for beating poor teams. You play who's on your schedule. The, you know, you said, I don't care if they're playing the A's, the B's, or the C's. Well, the B's are in town tonight. Yes, they They get the Red Sox, uh, starting tomorrow night, actually. Um, Red Sox are a little bit better team than, uh, than most and we'll see what happens. But I always wait two months before I make any wholesale pivots on a team because I've been burned before by doing that. So June 1st, I will let you know if if this is who they are. Jay walked in. The first thing I told Jay, hey, Guardians and foe. I know you did. I don't, I don't care, care who they, they play. I don't care who they play. It could be the Dodgers. It could be the pot, you know, Braves, whoever. But in all seriousness, man, I guess I'm just having fun watching. I can't remember – a season where they got off to this hot of a start as far as like hitting the baseball, right? Yeah. You know, it's April. You know, my cousin is famous for telling me, man, just wait till we get warm. That's when they'll start hitting. But they're hitting right now, and that's, when, that's what's been the driving force of us having the best record in baseball. Right. They're finding different ways to, to win games that I'm not really used to seeing from, from this team. And like I said earlier, all you can do is just play who's on your schedule, right? Now, coming up this weekend – they go to Atlanta, and then they turn around, and they go to Houston. So I think by – Now, Houston is, I, I think, bottom five in the all of baseball. Yeah. They're having a t- horrible start to the season. But that's sneaky right there. Yeah, I know, and, because and Houston's so, going to so get hot. By this time next week, I think that if this conversation was to come up again, I think we would have a better understanding of, okay, is this for real, or, are the, or is the bottom going to fall out, or is this going to be a team that – you know, it's going to beat up on teams that's on their level or lower and then struggle with teams that's like on the same level with the Braves and, right. and, and Houston and things like that. Yeah, so we'll find out. That's a nice we'll find out. stretch. Houston has a worse record than Oakland, by the way. I know that. Which, I think they have seven wins. I, yeah, they're seven and 16. I did not realize how bad they've been. They've been absolutely crap. horrible for a team that has, you know, playoff aspirations and World Series aspirations every year. I will say this. Um, one of the now we asked this question last week is, is is has anything you've seen been a bit of an indictment on Tito because you know in his 10 years here he only had two teams that were under 500 I think it was his first team and his last team right also his, happy birthday Tito happy yeah happy birthday, birthday Tito right. um and I said no but you know what I was thinking about something when I was watching the game yesterday I'm gonna see what you're gonna say I might Tito's teams were notorious slow starters. If you could go back and look at the Indians and Guardians records 
month by month with Tito. They were horrible in April, pretty bad in May, and August and September, they were world beaters. In fact, one year, the one year they made the playoffs, they had to win like 23 of their last 25 games to get in, and they did it. Is that when they chased down Chicago? Yes. I remember that. So I think that perhaps Stephen Vogt's a smart guy. And I remember one night we were at the, uh, it was, I say night, it was, it was early, late afternoon in Arizona. We had just finished our live hits for Channel 3's 6 o'clock show. And we had been there since 8 o'clock in the morning. And when I was leaving, I knew all the parking spots were labeled for, you know, Chris Antonetti, the, the management, not, not the players. They didn't have their own spots, but all the coaches and managers did. And we were gathering our gear and we were leaving. It was probably 7 o'clock <coughs> Eastern time. It was probably 5 o'clock Arizona time. And as I'm walking out, I'm looking at the cars. And they were all rental cars, but they were all, you know, gone, empty, 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 empty. One car in a spot, empty, 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 empty. The car that was there belonged to Stephen Vogt. And there, the, the, the facility was empty. They, had, um, they didn't have a game that day. It was before they started playing games, and they were just doing workouts. And the players like to get out at 1 o'clock so they can go get a round of golf in. Mm-hmm. And they had put in their work. They were done. But here it was, you know, local time, 5 o'clock. And I know that he was there at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. And everybody's gone, but Stephen Vogt is still there. And I was like, damn. You know, that's what you want to see in mm-hmm. your first-year manager. And he told me when we interviewed him, he said, look, there's a lot I don't know. I'm going to lean on these guys that have been here and been through this uh, to help get me through this. But one of the things he may have been doing, and I'm sure he's smart enough that he wanted to look at, so where has this team faltered in the past? And he probably realized that, hey, for Tito and all of his strengths, they were never a hot starter. Never. They always put themselves behind the eight ball Mm -hmm. and had to make it up. So maybe he's put more emphasis on April, and he let the guys know, look, you guys are falling out of contention in April and May, and then making it difficult on yourselves the last four months of the season. Let's, for a change, do well on the road and do well early. What's their road record, Mike? The Guardians this season on the road are 10-3. and three. Mm. Tied with the Boston Red Sox for the best road record. So, of I lied. Yeah. I lied. Milwaukee's 10-2. and two. I'm so sorry. Okay, 10-3 and three on the road. One of the things that struck me about the Texas Rangers road to the World Series last year, and I love this, if you looked at the teams they had beaten, they beat the Rays, Mm -hmm. the Orioles, they beat the, who did they beat in the ALCS? They beat the Orioles, then they beat... No, they beat the the Rays... Astros. Astros. So they beat the Rays, Orioles, Astros, Diamondbacks in the playoffs. R O A D. They were eleven and zero in road playoff games. That's crazy. I'm, I'm gonna tell you what, Jay. Um, the road to winning it on happens road. on the road. It's on the road. And I, I, Stephen Vogt saw that in the World Series last year. Now it's just ironic that the teams they beat all and their nicknames. Are R O A D, and they were eleven and zero on the R O A D, and they won the World Series. I think what, I, to me, what, what, what when we were, you were saying that, it, it brought me back to you know playing baseball at high schools. I played three sports, so by the time that you know we got around the baseball season, I was playing basketball. So you know, as you know, playing baseball. Those guys are inside hitting already starting yep. December. They're ready. They're ready to go. I get off the bat. I get off the basketball court and I need to see some pitches. So the first year I play, I'm like, OK, well, listen, I need to see as many pitches as possible. So I would work to count. Get I'm like, OK, I, ne- I got the speed of things. I'm ready to go. That first year I played as a freshman, I hit 415. The next year came around and my dad said, you know what? They're going to change that up on you. Uh, he's like you, you you see in a the difference between somebody that's a good hitter and, and a and a mediocre hitter is what are you gonna do? You can hit fastballs, but what are you gonna do when when the breaking pitches Adjusting. come? Yeah. That next year as a sophomore, 
I they would show me an early fastball and I would take it. But then the rest of the the rest of the count, I'm I'm facing off speed pitches and stuff off the outer thirds or inside of the plate. Nothing good to hit. And so my dad, you know, who has been my baseball coach since ever, he's like, "You hey, listen. Sometimes when you batting, the best pitch you're gonna see is the first, first one. Yep. And you might want to jump on that first pitch. And that was not our philosophy, but but I had to start becoming a a, a good first ball hitter because I knew that I was going to see until I was able to start hitting the curveballs. Then when you get older, you get to be a junior or senior. You can look for a curveball. You get sneaky. You're like, ah, this guy's coming with the curve. I'm but the, I think the, the biggest the biggest thing that I see between a couple years ago and now is the aggressiveness. Yep. It seems like these guys have the freedom at the plate to go up there and look Steven for something Kwan's to hit. Stephen Kwan's a great example. He, he's, he's up there playing. He's going up there hitting. He's, he, he ain't up there looking to, to work deep in the count. He looking to get, he's looking to get his 358. You can't be you can't be passive and be a 358. And hitter. he didn't even have a hit yesterday. So he's still bad. <laughs> I he's know. Still, he's still bad. Josh Taylor is going up there looking for something to drive, right? That is that is the attitude that I like from these guys because Stephen Vogt is saying, "Look, man, you might swing and miss, you might strike out a little bit, but guess what? You're going to give yourself an opportunity to hit the ball somewhere hard." Yeah. And I think that's the reason why these guys are getting runners in scoring position. They're up there driving runs. Well, look in. at yesterday, Naylor. It was a one-run game. Mm-hmm. Naylor comes to the plate against a lefty. Now you talk about a guy finding a weakness and turning it into a strength. Two years ago. He hit abysmal against left-handed hitting, left, left-handed left pitching. You and Bull argued fact, about that for for four months. Well, it got to the point where in the playoffs, I didn't want him in the lineup right. against lefties. He, he, was a, he, yeah. was, he was a liability. And I asked him in March in Arizona, how did you go from a subpar lefty yeah, yeah. against lefties? Because lefties are always notoriously bad against lefties, mm-hmm. but he was – worse. He was bottom of the barrel against lefties to now being one of the best left-handed hitters against left-handed pitching. How did you do that? He said, I just made it a priority in the off season. And I also realized that a lot of that was mindset. I was going up to the plate thinking I'm not supposed to get a hit. <laughs> do that every time. And you're going to be out of the major leagues real quick. I changed my approach mm-hmm. and I worked and I worked and I worked yesterday. He comes up in a one run close game. Three to two, bases loaded. He drives the double down nope. into the right field corner mm-hmm. off a left-hander that was a pitch that was one of the tough ones for him to handle. It was a sweeper that still finished in her half. He sat on it. He's waiting for it. And he put it into the right field corner, cleared the bases. Now a sick a three two game is six two, and you take the pressure off your bullpen. And you know about count. You know about when you play we've all had guys that you play on the team and they may be an eight, nine hole hitter. Not nothing much. You know, yeah, hey, if they get on, great. But let them have a heart, for a really good start. Yeah. That kind of stuff happens the whole year. Like there was a guy I played with. We didn't even want the ball to go to him, right? And they're like, no, listen, he's a nine hole hitter and we really don't want him in the field too much. He started off great. He started off, had a couple hits, started to feel his confidence. Next thing you know, this guy is probably one of our best clutch hitters the entire season. It's wow. funny like that in baseball. Yeah. When you see it going and you see the ball fall and you hit the ball hard and you're hitting the ball hard even if it goes to somebody, that that carryover confidence, he's seeing the ball better now. It's just it's something what's, weird about that. And what's interesting about that is baseball more than any other sport feeds or everything feeds off everything else. Winning breeds winning. Losing breeds losing. The Astros are not a seven win team, mm-hmm. but they got a couple of tough losses early. Mm-hmm. Confidence wanes, excitement wanes up and down the lineup. All nine guys. They're not going to play that way all year. They're going to catch a stride. Hopefully it's not against us. Right. One or two guys in the lineup are going to get hot and everybody's going to feed off that right now. What's going on with the guardians is one day feeds into the next day and in the micro Yep. In the lineup, one guy being hot feeds into the next guy being hot. And they keep doing this. And they keep doing they this. They keep so doing I, this. I remember the 19. They keep doing this. Too young for the, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love it. But, but I was the like, 84 have... Detroit Tigers started 35-5. and five. Everybody on the roster had a career year. 
after that 35 and 5 start, they were pretty much a 500 team. Mm-hmm. They were 30 games over 500 to start the season. That's crazy. They had pitchers who were not household names that were winning 15, 16, 17 games because they didn't want to be the one to let down the four game string where you had a quality start and a shutout or a complete game or a win. And it just fed on itself and it carried him all the way to a World Series championship. And I'm not predicting that for the Guardians, but what I'm saying is it feeds on itself and then it becomes almost like yeah. this like nuclear energy. You yeah. start the reaction and then it just feeds yeah. off of itself right. and it keeps going. That's what it feels like this team is doing right now. Three things, and it's all go it all goes back to Stephen Vogt, right? We all know life and death is in the power of the tongue. We know that positive affirmations give off positive energy and energy is contagious, right? Stephen Vogt from day one has had the words World Series in his mouth and he has I not loved backed it. off of that, right? I loved it. And just like Kevin Stefanski, you know how we used to talk about he says certain things and now you see his team buying into the culture. You see the same thing going on right now with the Cleveland Guardians. This man has been talking about being more aggressive at the plate from day one. Yep. He's been talking about this team being a World Series And it's contender manifested itself to end the results. From day one. And now as these players are constantly hearing their manager talk like this, that's, that's like speaking life into your team, right? You're not speaking death into your team, right? And then the affirmations is, I believe this team is good enough. I believe we have what it takes. That's giving off positive energy to everybody that's in that line. So true. Right? Because you look at how they're playing. They're playing with a bunch of confidence. This is a bunch of young dudes that none of us really expected to be doing anything with they're doing. I was sitting on this set a month ago joking about Gabriel Arias and how Chris Antonetti, Antonetti want me to believe that he's going to like live up to his potential. Clutch and he's the other actually day. Yeah, doing he it. Yeah. He's actually doing it. And so, so when you talk about Stephen Vogt, you know, being in Arizona and being the guy that's always staying late, you know, when you talk about him changing the psyche of the players when they approach the plate and hitting the baseball, and I'm talking about just the words that he's speaking out of his mouth, I think all of that – is, is the reason why the Guardians are off to the, to the hot start that they are. Because he has this team believing that regardless of what the naysayers say, they can beat anybody. Yeah, now look, I, 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 we are getting very, very excited about this team, and it's easy to do. Guardians and folks. And uh, <laughs> I, I, love the, I love where they are and what they've done, but I'm also a realist, and I know that payroll at some point impacts production. It just does. I mean, it does not maybe in 20 games. Double. And like I said, if, if, if the season were a game, there'd be one out in the second inning. Double so we're really early in the process. But to your point, and it shocked me when he said it, because I'd done 23 or 24 interviews before Stephen Vogt sat down in the chair. And I asked everybody the same question. 2024 will be a successful season if. And everybody had a different answer. Some guys were like, if our starting pitching stays healthy. If we can get the middle of the order to... Uh, carry the, what the front half is doing. If we hit more home runs, if our bullpen can bounce back to 2022 form. One man sat in that chair when I asked that question and answered it this way. If we win the World Series. And I was taken aback by it. I got to be honest with you. I'm like, wow, rookie mistake. You don't talk about winning the World Series in, <laughs> in February. You don't do that. Especially with a team that missed the playoffs the year before and had and did not make any major acquisitions. But... He embraced it like it was matter of fact. So if he told me that, I know his team is hearing that. And when you hear it enough and you start to play well, you can start to believe it. So I'm not predicting the World Series, but what I'm predicting is this is going to be a fun baseball season. Uh, Absolutely. A very fun baseball season. Speaking of things you don't do before we get to Super Chats, Josh Naylor has become a fan favorite, not just in Cleveland, but around the country for things like this, which we do not recommend. Steve, take that. I love you, please. Do not recommend, but this was awesome. Hit the home run, puts the team up, and then, Jay, I mean, you played more baseball than all of us combined. Uh, concussion protocol or genius? No, genius. Remember, he's the one that headbutted uh, Terry Francona after a big win last year. What I wish this video showed was the Rays' first baseman, who I like. He's a good ball player, actually chirping at Josh Naylor as he crosses first base. And I, can, I don't know what he said. I couldn't read lips. Um, but I, I imagine what he said was, 
Act like a pro. Act like you've been here before. Who the hell are you trying to show up? That's not what it was about. What it was about was earlier in the bat, in the at-bat, he swung at a pitch and got put a bad pit, a bad swing on a good pitch. And he was mad at himself. Earlier in the game, he got into one that he drove on a line to deep center field that didn't get out. Uh-huh. He was frustrated. When he crossed home plate, Stephen Kwan was there to greet him. And he grabbed Stephen Kwan by the jersey right up by the neck and shook him. <laughs> like, if, if you didn't He's know Josh man. Naylor... You might look at that and be like, what the hell is wrong with this <laughs> yeah. maniac? He used to beat up on Bo all the time. He I know he to. did. <laughs> but what I'm looking at it and what I'm saying is, this is what a leader looks like. This is a guy that can get 24 guys to stand behind him and take whatever damn hill he wants to take. Remember when he hit the big home run in the Yankee series and he did the rock the baby. baby. Mm-hmm. Now, Yankee fans don't like when you do that kind of shit to their team. They made it brutal on him for his remaining at-bats at Yankee Stadium. But what it told me was, oh, this is a dude that's not afraid to write big checks. Hey, I'm all, I'm all for it. I'm all for the energy. Like, me too. Like, listen, I love it. I love it. I, and listen, when, Look you, at that. when you talk about them old school, old school Indians, <laughs> they, was come, they come in your house. And tell you what they was gonna do and hit five, six bombs on you, and still do, and and, 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 do, and look at you like, what you gonna do about it? I like that energy, man. He is Listen, a superstar. Josh Naylor won all the smoke, and Jose will knock you out. We good. <laughs> yeah, we're very good. <laughs> we good. You know, it's funny. I also asked all the players, who do you want most on your side when a fight breaks out? And a couple guys um, surprised me. Said Hunter Gaddis, which he's a big dude. He pretty big. But just about everybody said Jose or Josh. And how Even many Quan said that on the show? How, how many more years Quan and Naylor got? And so I got a friend. Well, Quan, Quan, Quan's he, got a while. Naylor, it's coming up. They got to make a decision pretty soon on that him. That decision's easy. We're gonna you, talk you pay about that man whatever he I, needs. I got a friend in Cincinnati. Do not let that guy get away. And uh, there, it's this video of Ellie certain around and he like yeah man we got ellie down here i said jose would knock ellie out though if it came down to it <laughs> i'm afraid nobody wants those hands he has heavy hands hands of stone all right guys That's we have a couple super chats to wrap up but first every monday <laughs> we send out a newsletter hands. if you guys want to subscribe to the newsletter you can text the number at the bottom of your screen earl wrote a little recap on the Cavs game one win. It's got some links to some stuff you missed from last week. And also, shout out to Phil Bowman for being our member of the week. He gifted 17 memberships. So shout out to Phil Bowman for doing that. Got, yeah, got Phil. super chats here. We got two. First one comes from Daryl, who says, Go Cavs. 2 0 guards. What a job by our new manager, Steven Vote. Uh, Steven, vote of confidence. Steven, Love cast it. your vote. Steven, vote for issue one, LOL. <laughs> And our Mac Dog has a question for all you guys. He says, Evan Mobley is an average big man. He's not going to be a big body like Giannis or a scorer like Kevin Durant. Do any of the three panelists think his career stats of 11.8 points per game, 68% from the free throw line, 8.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks warrants a max deal? No. But I also don't think Darius Garland should have a max deal. When you say warrants, so here's the thing. What, the way it works in the NBA, it's not about... I think he's not asking, will he get it? Because we know no, the I know he's not. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Warrant, warrants, warrant. W- warrants or will is two different things. Um, he'll probably end up getting a max deal. Um, how many more years does he have on his contract before he, they need to make a decision? Two? Yes, two. They got, well, they'll extend him next summer. So, okay. He, can, he, can he become a max player in a year? Sure. I mean... Tyrese Halliburton is a max player. He wasn't a max player when he was in the league. People work. Some people you can see as evidence. Some people work their way into it or just have a good year. So will he probably be a max player? Sure. But based on the hate that's production in the bar now, to now, now, no. Like you've got to be careful. You can't have multiple players on these deals that other teams wouldn't be lining up to give max deals to. Now they. They missed, I think they missed on Darius Garland being a max player. I think they did too. But at the time, I could see why they gave it to him because they couldn't have foreseen that they was going to get Donovan Mitchell. No. So it, that's the way it works, right? It's a little tricky. And it, it's not like, I'm not, I'm not going to act like it's, it's not like a difficult job. It is. It's projecting whether somebody's going to be a max player or not. I think he doesn't need to be a max player for everybody. If they can figure out for him to be a max player for the Cavs and what they do, fine. 
I, a couple years ago, Tristan Thompson was an $85 million player. No. I don't think Draymond Green was either, but for what they did back right. in 16, they were valuable. All fair points. Warrants and deserves are two completely different conversations because he will get a max contract. Luckily, you don't have to make the decision until next season. So right. you'll yeah. see with another offseason. And granted, we said that heading into this season, but. Right, but you know what he's starting to feel like? It's now David and Joku. Remember yeah, David and Joku? Exactly. We're like, okay, this dude looks like, uh, mm. looks like Tarzan, but he's not, he's, he's not, I don't want to say he's playing like Jane, but he sure as hell wasn't playing like Tarzan. Now he looks like Tarzan and plays like Tarzan. Now I will say this. But I've it took seen, five years to get six years to get him there. I've seen people change minds in the playoffs. In the playoffs, <laughs> Like, it's, it's a small sample size, but people get paid in yeah, the Yeah, but playoffs. you got to be that throat cutter. Yeah, you, you th- got to be that guy that is the reason that you win, not yeah. a piece yeah. to the puzzle. If he plays— Donovan Mitchell is the reason the Cavs are going to win certain playoff games. If he averages 24 and 12 against the Celtics— Oh, my. I think we— we be like, on to something. Yeah, we won't. Yeah, we'll figure it out. You just dumped out the gym with them numbers. I said, yeah, those are 24 and 12. Like, that's what they're going to need for them to win Ooh. some games. That is a max player on any team. We'll see you in overtime. Peace. Peace.